they were after was, I, I, I'm really, you know, it says it in the order. Um, I'll just have to rest on that, which I've been trying to do because I really don't want to um, say anything that isn't accurate. And like the judge just said, my opinion on the order doesn't matter. I was suspended for 60 days and I just went through two years of probation. And it, my opinion on that order doesn't matter at all. It's, it, it happened, it occurred, and I'm, um, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be off probation. Ms. McDonald, did you read the court's order, the court suspension order? Yeah, I've read it uh, uh, a while ago, but I've read it, yes. So if you want to point to that specific uh, uh, piece where they said I lied about a judge, I don't think they came out and said that at all. Um, well, so. and I, I'm not saying that they used those words that you lied about a judge. Uh, but the court's overall conclusion was that your statements about the judge, judge's integrity were false. Very specific ones. Not the ones that were in my uh, lawsuit. My law, the lawsuit that I did for Sandra Guzzini Recchi was a federal lawsuit. It was very extensive, very, very detailed. And I think the specific things that the Supreme Court said is that I, I, his impartiality, that I impugned his impartiality by saying he wasn't always impartial. Ms. McDonald, I'd like to um, move on to your representation of Mr. Potvin. So Mr. Potvin came to you in 2018 seeking some assistance with a personal injury matter. Is that correct? Yes, he did. And you agreed to review um, some materials that he provided to you. Is that correct? I did agree to the materials. And we also got some releases and more materials. OK. And kind of the purpose initially was for you to determine whether he had a viable personal injury claim. Right, we were just going to review the materials, and I think it had a, a deadline to finish on July 1 of that year <clears throat> in the agreement. Uh, maybe you could help me. We could be looking at it. Sure. So, Ms. Ms. Uh, McDonald, I, I think you're referring to Exhibit 15, and the page number for you is 220. Okay. Thank you. So, Miss Miss McDonald, or let me know, let me know when you have that available for you to see. I have it in front of me. Okay. So, according to your your retainer agreement. Um, you agreed to charge Mr. Potvin a $500 flat fee for right. the purpose of reviewing his materials, correct? Right. And the amount is written, the amount of $500 is written right there on your fee agreement, correct? Right. And you actually used the term flat fee in this retainer. I did. It was a flat fee retainer. Now, Ms. McDonald, you're familiar with the Minnesota Rules of Professional Conduct regarding flat fees, right? I am. And you know that Rule 1.5B1 specifically states that flat fees constitute complete payment for specified legal services. Is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. So even though you agreed to review Mr. Potvin's materials for $500, you charged him an extra $50 on top of that as a, quote, administration fee to open his file. That's not the way it happens. But yes, we, we charge an administrative fee. It's, it's right on our fee agreements. Administration fee to open file $50. Um, and if I could speak to Mr. Potvin's testimony, could, can I speak? Well, no, Ms. McDonald, what I'm asking you is that 
even though you told Mr. Potvin that you were going to handle his case for a $500 flat fee, you added an additional charge of $50 to open up a file for him. No, the administrative fees paid uh, to open up the file. It's right on the retainer agreement. It says administrative fee to open up the file, $50. He paid the $50 before this retainer agreement. He had come in and uh, he was a walk-in and I met with him extensively about his case at that point and he wanted me to, op to open a file just to collect more information. I, we weren't sure whether we were gonna represent him or not, or even have an agreement for representation. So that's an administrative fee that McDonald Law Firm has. Okay, so Mr. Potman paid you $50 to open a fee, $500 for your representation um, in reviewing his case, yeah. and then paid you an additional $50 after that as well. Is that correct? I don't believe he paid me an additional $50. He paid me $50 and then at, in your exhibits, there's the $500. He never paid me another, uh, an, I never asked for another $50. I had already got the $50 with my uh, uh, free consultation with him when he walked in. So then this, the second meeting, we just we went through the retainer with him and uh, then he paid $500 and it says right here to review data provided for PI case possible ends July 1 when review is completed. So basically it had from uh, the time we signed this June 5th to July 1, we were going to complete the review in three weeks. So Ms. McDonald, you heard Mr. Potvin testify earlier this morning, correct? Right. And he testified that after paying you $50 and then $500, that you asked him for an additional $50. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So is it your testimony that he's lying about you asking him to pay him an additional $50? I think he's confusing the $50. I, I didn't ask him. We finished the work. I, I wouldn't ask him for another $50. Okay, but you, I think he's um, just confusing the $50, that's all. So on page 221 for you, and this would be page two of exhibit 15. Um, Sorry, my phone. Uh, you can see that Mr. Potvin hand wrote some notes on the retainer, correct? Yes, I can see that. And he's pretty clear from the notes that he made two separate $50 additional payments to you, correct? Right, I think he's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it doesn't appear from Mr. Poppins' notes here that he was confused about the amount of money that he paid you. Right. Okay, he specifically wrote out $50 to open the file, $300 Michelle, $200 Carlova, $50 to update file, and he even has a date paid on July 16, 2018, for a $600 total, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, Ms. McDonald, uh, the, Mr. Potvin did, in fact, pay you the $500 uh, for the flat fee, correct? Yes, he did. And that, um, the cashiers, or the money order that he gave you is um, accurately reflected in exhibit 16. Yeah. And that would be page 222 for you. Right. Right. <clears throat> now you took that $500 and split that fee with another attorney. Is that correct? Right, I put it in trust and I, I split the fee with one of my independent contractors. This, this fee agreement was with McDonald Law Firm and Car uh, Richard Pott and McDonald Law Firm and Carloba Powell. So that you're, you're kind of mixing a few rules here. Uh, we were both, the reason for the, uh, the splitting of the fee is when lawyers are not from the same firm. Carloba Powell actually was, uh, was working for me. So um, she was working for McDonald Law Firm. So when she, uh, when, 
that's why she signed the agreement. We were both responsible for the file. Uh, she didn't even have to be on the agreement, and I could have paid her, but I like to do it this way. I like to be in integrity and have, um, have both of us on the file. So I was signing as McDonald Law Firm, um, and she was signing as the attorney. <laughs> okay, so it, it's your position that, it's your testimony that in the summer, or at least in June of 2018, that Miss Adams Powell was an employee of yours? Yeah, she was an independent contractor. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> She actually has an office, uh, office shares with me. She, I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Ms. McDonald? Ms. McDonald, I didn't hear what you just said. Could you please repeat it? I'm not sure what I said. I said she was an independent contractor with me. Right, and then did did you say that Miss Carl Miss Adams Powell office shared with you? Yeah, she pays she pays rent, and I pay rent to the same place, so she's in the same office. Okay, so your your testimony is that Miss Adams Powell at the time was an independent contractor of the McDonald Law Firm. Right. And did you have her identified that way on your website or any of your materials? No. Well, Ms. McDonald, going back to that Exhibit 15, uh, page two of exhibit 15, which is page 221 for you. Um, you agree that the writing, the handwriting at the bottom of that page is not yours, correct? Right. And that, that it's Mr. Potvin's. Right. So the independent contractor issue aside, you did not create any kind of document to um, explain to Mr. Potvin that you were going to be sharing this fee with Ms. Adams Powell. Is that correct? It's, it's this document. He wrote it down. I, I put the fee in trust anyway, so. Um. Right, and I, I'm not asking you about where you deposited the funds. I'm asking whether you reduced the agreement that Ms. Adams Powell was going to uh, received some of Mr. Potvin's retainer fee um, into writing. I did not reduce it to writing. He did by writing it down while I said. Okay, but you also heard Mr. Potvin testify this morning, correct? I did. And he indicated that these notes that he put at the bottom of the retainer agreement, uh, that he did not do that when he initially retained you. He testified that he wrote these notes on there in August when he came to speak to you and you told him that you weren't going to take his case anymore. I get, he's mixing things up again. I met with him. He paid $50. When he talks about I needed that retainer, I didn't get a retainer, uh, this $50 that, that needed to be paid, uh, he's mixing things up. We, then we met. Uh, extensively. Uh, Karlova was there and we decided to help him by reviewing his file. Okay, but Ms. McDonald, I'm asking you whether you heard Mr. Potvin testify this morning and say that he didn't make these notations to the retainer agreement at the time that he retained you. He stated it was about two or three months later. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that was the case. Uh, because he, he got this retainer when we met. He got a copy of it when we met. So he took it home. That's what I'm trying to explain. When he says he didn't get the retainer, what he was talking about was that I, uh, between the time of the $50 payment and the time of this retainer, when uh, uh, Carloba was out of town, Carloba does personal injury. 
So I was talking with her about whether she wanted to take the case and review it. And that's what he's talking about. When he talks about $50 being paid and not getting a retainer and Carlova being on vacation, those kinds of things, it's because uh, we were we were setting up a hearing and deciding you know what we were going to do and, and meeting with him after she got back. Okay, but I am not asking you about the $50. I'm asking you whether you recall Mr. Potvin testifying this morning and stating that these comments that are written on the retainer agreement regarding the fee split were made by him after the fact, after you had already determined you weren't taking his case. Right. So when I asked you whether you reduce to writing this fee splitting agreement and you say, well, it's written there on the retainer agreement. Um, that information wasn't written until after you had already agreed to this fee splitting arrangement with Miss Adams Powell. It was verbal, verbal the day okay. that we met. Uh, right. because so I do typically, if somebody asks, I'll tell them he must have asked and then I'll okay. tell them what the fee split is. But Ms. McDonald, do you understand that the rule requires that the fee split be detailed in writing? Mm -hmm. I do. One of the rules requires that, but this was a contract with McDonald Law Firm. So, no, it's in writing. It's in his handwriting. And yes, I acknowledge that the fee split is not on this retainer agreement. I acknowledge that. Okay. So Ms. McDonald, you heard Mr. Potvin testify this morning that he requested a copy of his retainer agreement pretty much as soon as it was signed, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Here's and what happened. That's what I'm trying to get at. The $50 was paid. This is the retainer agreement. He was requesting that we were going to sit down and go over it. See, I was checking with Carlova to see if we would be, she'd be able to, to at least look at the case with me and see if it's something that she would want to take on. So when he's talking about not getting his retain his uh, signed copy of his retainer, that's what he's talking about. Okay, so he's he's saying that he asked you for a copy of the retainer agreement and that you didn't initially provide it to him. Yeah, he was asking me for an unsigned copy of a retainer agreement. We hadn't been retained yet. So when he paid the fifty dollars, uh, when I had met with him, I he he was uh, calling and making sure that you know we were going to meet again, and I had to check with Carlova to see if this was something that she wanted to take on to review. So that's the agreement for representation. He's saying he didn't get. Uh, then we met, and then I wrote it. I sat down with him. Carlova decided to take the case. And then we went through the agreement for representation and then he got it. Okay, you agree that you didn't provide him with a copy of the retainer fee until August. Was that correct? No, I gave him a copy of the retainer fee the day it was signed. Would that, is that so your testimony is that you provided him with a copy of the retainer on June 5th of 2018? Uh, after we signed it, yes, June 5th, 2018, I provided him with a copy of the retainer agreement. Okay, but you heard Mr. Mr. Potvin testify this morning that that's not how the events occurred, correct? I, I get, again, I think he's conflating things because we were deciding whether we we're going to take the case or not. So he's talking about another retainer agreement. Uh, that would have been on a contingency fee basis. That's what he's talking about, that he didn't get till July or okay. not get. He's not talking about this one. So I don't think he's lying. He's just mixing up things. So, but Mr. Potvin, you can see on the, on page two of exhibit five, which is page 221 for you, that he wrote a note that he didn't receive the retainer agreement until August 9, 2018 when my case was dropped and I picked up my file. Mm -hmm. Well, he probably received another copy of the retainer agreement, uh, but he okay. because he received his whole file, but he had received one right off the bat. He even received copies of what we took from him. I'd always do that. 
even though it was very extensive, I made copies of all of the documents for my for him and put the originals in my file. So when he came to get the file, he already had a copy. But I, I still give clients another copy of their file if they want it. And then we had the releases in there and things like that had gotten some more information. Great, Ms. McDonald, I'd like to um, switch gears and talk to you about your lawsuit against Mr. Broadcorn and missing in Minnesota. Right. So on June 18th of 2018, you filed a lawsuit against Mr. Broadcorb and missing, Min missing in Minnesota for defamation and defamation by implication. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And you filed that lawsuit um, in your name, Michelle McDonald, but also on behalf of your law firm. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm looking for it here. Yes, I, saw, I filed it on behalf of myself and my law firm for defamation and defamation by implication. And you, for the initial complaint that was filed on June 18, 2018, um, you, wrote, you wrote out all of the allegations in that complaint, correct? Right. And so you were responsible for all of the content. I was responsible for all the content, yes, I and was. you signed the complaint as the attorney of record on the matter. Right. And then a few weeks later, in July of 2018, you retained an attorney who filed an amended complaint um, on your behalf in that matter. Yes. Okay, and the amended complaint that Ms. Adams Powell, I'm sorry, Ms. Adams Powell is the attorney that you retained to represent you in July um, on your lawsuit, correct? Right. And the amended complaint that Ms. Adams Powell filed was identical to the complaint that you drafted um, and whose content you were responsible for um, in June. Correct. It wasn't identical, but it was very close. Remember, similar is not the same. It was similar. Okay. Well, can can you identify what was different between the original complaint and the amended complaint? Probably. I don't have to go through that, but I think I actually, I I, I don't have to go through that. It could have been just uh, that Carlova signed it and took okay. over. All right. Now, at the time that you filed this lawsuit against Mr. Broadcord, you were in the first couple of months of your probation, correct? I was. Mm -hmm. And as we discussed earlier, one of the conditions of your probation was that you initiate and maintain procedures to ensure thorough inquiry into and verification of factual allegations in your pleadings and court filings. Right. Correct? And that's directly from, from the court's probation order, that language I just used, correct? Right. And I always have done that. I always have my clients verify the pleadings. So, and I think I verified it in this case. So you were- I wasn't, I wasn't the client until Carlova took over the case. I was the litigant. Right, you, you were the litigant and the, the court's order to you as part of your probation was that you as the attorney mm -hmm. undergo a process of making sure that your, fact, that your claims are factual, correct? Absolutely, uh -huh. right, okay. absolutely. And you were also under a court order for your probation to follow the rules of professional conduct, correct? I'm always under court order since I've been practicing law 33 years ago to follow the rules of professional conduct. It's no different. And you are aware, of course, that the rules of professional conduct prohibit you as an attorney from filing claims that have no basis um, in fact or law um, that is not frivolous. And that's rule 3.1, correct? Absolutely. Yes, I'm very much aware of that law. 
And you, you said you're very much aware of it and you also know about the requirements of rule 3.1 because that was one of the rules that you were um, suspended for violating back in 2018, correct? Uh, I believe so, yes. Uh, I believe it was because of the lawsuit that I filed against the judge, but that was verified by the client. And right. I think that, what, what ended up happening with the Supreme Court said, well, you can't just verify your clients, um, what your client tells you. Right. You as the attorney have an obligation to make sure that the pleadings that you are filing have a factual basis. Right. And specifically, the court found in your previous disciplinary case that you violated Rule 3.1 in regards to your lawsuit against Judge Knudsen. Right. So the first allegation um, that you made against Mr. Brad Corbin missing in Minnesota was that he falsely reported on his blog that you were a person of interest in the disappearance of your client's children. Is that correct? Right. And you were aware at the time that you drafted the complaint against Mr. Brad Corbin that other news agencies had already identified you as a person of interest in the matter. No, I was not aware. <clears throat> okay, so you're saying that in 2018, when you drafted the complaint against Mr. Broadcorn, that you had no idea that other news agencies had identified you as a person of interest in um, in the children's disappearance? That's a different question. You asked me if there are other news agencies. One report, and I think Mr. Broadcorp spoke to it, from Brandon Stahl of the Star Tribune, he stated that I was a person of interest. That was way back when, when I filed this lawsuit, it was years later, but way back when he stated that. So that was my objection that how can you just persistently be a pers person of interest? Uh, and and the, 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 it is even more serious than that because the, uh, the, when I inquired about whether I was a person of interest, the officer said to me, well, that's you, your issue is with Broadcorp. We don't even use that term. We don't use person of interest as a term. That's a, that's a media term. Okay. So, Ms. McDonald, my question to you is, when you filed your complaint against Mr. Broadcorp in June of 2018, you were aware that other news agencies, such as the Star Tribune, had already used the term personal person of interest in reference to you. Now you have another question. I was aware of one, the Star Tribune, one news agency they printed this and they never printed it again. I emailed Brandon Stahl. I said, stop it. And he took, he never printed it again. Brandon Stahl never, ever printed it again. Okay. After so that, printed it that day, but Broadcorp continued on. So okay. there you go. But the, the point is that you were aware that another agency, news agency, had, I, had already identified you in an article as a person of interest. Right, the Star Tribune, Brandon Stahl, had identified me as a person of interest. And you already, you knew that. I, I, I don't know when I became aware of that. I don't know if it was after Broadcorp told me, uh, but I, I remember, I, I don't know when I became aware of it, but I was certainly aware of it when I filed this complaint because I mentioned it in the complaint. Okay, and that, that is what I'm asking. You, you were aware that the Star Tribune had called you a person of interest when you filed your complaint for defamation against Mr. Broadcorp. Again, you're still being vague and generalized. generalized. Brandon Stahl wrote that I was a person of interest in the case. Brandon Stahl of the Star Tribune. One reporter wrote it. Okay, so you were aware that one other agency, the Star Tribune, had already run an article identifying you as a person of interest. 
when you filed the complaint against Mr. Broadcorp for defamation? Yeah. I asked and answered three times. Uh, the objection is sustained. So, Mr. Donald, in your lawsuit, Mr. Broadcorp's defense to your allegation was that he personally spoke with the Lakeville Police Department and that they identified you as a person of interest. Did you hear? That's what he said, and that was hearsay. I, they didn't tell me that. <clears throat> they told okay. me the opposite. But you agree that that is what Mr. Broadcorp's defense was to your accusation of defamation? Right. So your claim that Mr. Broadcorp falsely identified you as a person of interest in the article has no basis in fact, correct? Of course it has a basis in fact. He identified me as a person of interest when I wasn't. Okay, but you... You understand that Mr. Broadcorp's testimony is that he used that term because the Lakeville Police Department used that term in a conversation with him. And they used a different term in the conversation with me. So uh, again, what the Lakeville Police Department told me is that is not a, a term. That's only a term that reporters use. We don't use that term. If we are going to use a term, it's going to be a suspect. Okay. So they said, your issue is with Broadcorp. We do not use the officers don't go around. And I, I don't know. They don't go around saying this one's a person of interest. That's one's a person of interest. They don't. That's a reporter term. And he continues to keep on saying that I am when the case is over. Okay. But the bottom line is, you accused Mr. Broadcorp of falsely identifying you as a person of interest, and the court considered that argument as part of your lawsuit, correct? Well, he never answered the lawsuit, but you could say that. It's in the, it's, it speaks for itself, the order. Okay. But and what I think what, uh, what the judge determined was that me talking to the police and them telling me what they told me, that I wasn't a person of interest, that that was a, a, a term uh, uh, that only reporters use, uh, couldn't be admissible. But the fact that um, Mr. Broadcorp, who was the defendant, got it from uh, uh, the police uh, and, uh, and got it from the Star Tribune, they, they admitted, admitted that somehow. And they had a, a, a decent reasoning for doing that. But they said that he, you know, since he uh, heard it on the news or whatever and kind of repeated it, that he wasn't, it wasn't, uh, he wasn't being ma in malice. Uh, and that was the issue was, was it malice? Okay. So the, the court ultimately concluded that Mr. Broadcorp's, Broadcorp's use of the term person of interest um, was not defamation against you. I was not malicious. I mean, excuse me. I object to what the court decided. The yeah. court's records speak for themselves. Yeah. The and court, look, excuse me, and I'm looking at it right now, and Ms. Nayaki, I think that we have uh, exhausted this line of questioning um, because, once again, as Mr. Eng pointed out, the, the decision of the court, I'm looking at it right now, speaks for itself. So, Donald, your next claim um, against Mr. Broadford was that he falsely reported that you had been convicted of a DWI um, on his blog. Is that correct? That's correct. And you also claimed um, that Mr. Broadcorp had made that statement that you were convicted of a DWI on the social media platform Twitter. So um, you know what? You that was the one I complained of the Twitter. I don't know what he did on his blog. I think he presented something that he did on his blog. That wasn't even what I was complaining about. I was complaining about something on Twitter. So I'm going to 
my your first question I thought you were talking about Twitter I don't I don't know what he's done on his blog except okay. for what he told me in the lawsuit so what, you made an accusation that he made false statements on Twitter about you and your um, DWI arrest but when the um, during litigation you were unable to provide any evidence to support that claim is that correct uh, that is not correct. I had my verified affidavit <laughs> that mentioned the tweet, and I had the tweet. Uh, and we'll explain why we never got to present any evidence. Okay, we didn't get to present any evidence. The judge dismissed it on summary judgment. Mr. Broadcub never answered the complaint. Okay, but other than your affidavit saying that this event occurred, uh, you did not have evidence that Mr. Broadcorp made that statement. I had evidence of the tweet. But the court um, found that Mr. Broadcorp did not engage in defamation by making that statement about you. Object again as to what the court's ruling is. Sustained. Ms. McDonald, as you've said, the court uh, granted summary judgment regarding your defamation case. Is that correct? Right. And you appealed the district court's decision uh, to the Court of Appeals, correct? Right. And the Court of Appeals upheld the district court's um, rulings. Right. So the last accusation that you made against Mr. Broadcorb um, as part of your lawsuit against him um, is that he published a photo of you on his blog um, as if a mugshot. And the as if a mugshot portion is a quote, um, I believe that you've used, is that correct? That's in my complaint, yes. Okay. So your claim for defamation um, regarding this is that the photo that Mr. Broadcorp used is not a mugshot. I just he photo he he put it on as if a mugshot. Uh, so it is it isn't a mugshot. I'll put it that way. It is is not a mugshot. No. Okay, so Miss Miss McDonald. As far as I know, it's not a mugshot. Okay, Miss McDonald, I'd like to direct your attention to Exhibit Eight, which for you is page one hundred and thirteen. And just let me know when you arrive at that page. I'm here. Okay. So the first page of Exhibit 8 is an affidavit from the Dakota County Sheriff's Office. Is that correct? Right. right. And um, the affidavit states, um, I, Jody Roloff, being first duly sworn, depose and state as follows. One, I am employed by the Office of the Dakota County Sheriff's Office as Administrative Lieutenant for the Dakota County Jail. Correct? Correct. And number two states, as Administrative Lieutenant, I have access to all inmate records on file with the Dakota County Sheriff's Office, correct? Right. And then line three states, the records attached here to are true and correct copies of the inmate record on file at the Dakota County Jail for Michelle um, NMN McDonald, date of birth, November 5, 1961, correct? Right. And then this affidavit um, has been notarized and signed by, um, by Jody Roloff of the Dakota County Sheriff's Office, correct? Right. And then if we turn to the, the next page, which is Exhibit 8, page 2, and also page 114 um, with the Bates numbering, what's depicted on Exhibit 8, page 2 is a photo of you 
and underneath the photo there and it so there's a photo of you Ms. McDonald and it states your name correct right I'm sorry did you answer Ms. McDonald right yeah okay. that's the photo of me okay. I'd rather you not read public record the number and all that please okay yeah. underneath your name there is um, a caption that says booking number and then there is a number provided there. Is that correct? Right. And then to the right of the, the name Michelle McDonald and a booking number is kind of a timestamp that states mm -hmm. September 12, uh, 10, sorry, September 12, 2013, 10 PM, correct? Right. And September 12th of 2013 is in fact the date that you were arrested in the courtroom during Ms. Grazini Rusick's trial. Is that correct? That's correct. And you spent a lot of time in your last referee hearing discussing how you were handcuffed and that um, there was a chain connecting your hands to your waist um, in connection with that arrest, correct? Objection irrelevant today. Sustained. Ms. McDonald, you stated in the last referee hearing that you were in custody for over 24 hours in regard to that arrest, correct? Objection irrelevant today. Sustained. So Ms. McDonald, you, you've been able to review Exhibit 8 and is it your position today that Exhibit 8 is not a booking photo of you? It apparently is. It's not a mugshot. It apparently is, but again, I was never booked. I don't know where they came up with this booking photo. Okay, so I, I understand that your yeah. opinion is that you were never booked, but you agree that you were arrested in the courtroom and handcuffed and held in custody for a period of time. Right. My opinion is... That's not my opinion. They obviously must have backtracked and booked me. But when I left, when Judge, I think it was a judge from Dakota County, finally, finally released me, he said, I do not have to be booked. He, he signed a court order that said that. So I don't know where this booking photo came from. Um, it, it's after the fact. And I, I've never seen this with numbers under it before. So you, you obtained this. I had never seen it. When Broadcarb was posting it, he didn't post it as anything. He just posted it with other people that had been convic convicted felons, okay? And he, he posted this. He didn't say where it came from. He didn't say it came from Dakota County. He didn't say when it was taken. It, it was years later. He came up with it years later, never had posted it before. For two, three years, never got posted. And he just found it somewhere and started posting it on his website. The case, this case had been dismissed. He's still posting it when the other cases have been dismissed and resolved. So I'm not lying that he's defaming me. Okay, but Ms. McDonald, I just want to make sure I understand your position. You have reviewed this exhibit and your position is this is not a booking photo. It must be a booking photo. You're, you're mixing things again. We're talking about a mug shot. He posted it as if a mug shot. This must be a booking photo. But, he, uh, but I was never booked, so they must have used the photo that they took and, and created this. Okay, so your, your position is that you were never booked, but you agree that a booking photo was recorded by the Dakota County Sheriff's Office. It's, it, yeah, after the fact. I mean, because if I wasn't, if a judge orders me that I don't have to be booked, then, and it, without a motion, then, and then this appears, a picture that they took, that's, that's my issue. I, w I wasn't booked, but I guess they're claiming that I was. Okay. But when Mr. Broadcorp published this photo on his website, mm -hmm. 
um, and you, you referenced that it was as if a mugshot, you agreed that this is a booking photo of you that was provided by the sheriff's office. No, I don't agree. I don't agree. He, he came up with this years later. I think it was three years. And this, this never had come, come to light. But that, that particular case had never went anywhere, that arrest for me in court, and, and, and was dismissed. And then he came up with this. All of a sudden, I see it on his website with other, other real mugshots, I guess, okay, but of, of people that were charged with felonies, he had it up there with one, two, three, four, four people that were charged with felonies. And all of a sudden, my picture's up there. This picture comes out of nowhere. Okay, and, and Ms. McDonald. It's up there with the felons. Ms. McDonald. Uh, the, you know, the, the, they, they were charged. Ms. McDonald, the photo that you viewed on Mr. Broadcorp's blog um, that you took issue with and used as the part of the basis for your lawsuit, that photo is identical to the photo that's depicted in Exhibit 8, correct? Yes, it is. It is. Okay, so your Except it, it doesn't say, it doesn't say my name, it doesn't say booking photo, it doesn't say any of that. He's, he's never, when I filed this complaint, he had never set, identified where this picture was. He didn't excuse have my me, name. Excuse me. Excuse me. I um, we've been at this for about an hour and a half now, and uh, uh, I think it's about time to take a break. Ms. Rutnayaka, can you tell me how much more you have of this witness? Can we finish it in the next few minutes? Uh, and if not, we need to take a break. What do you think? Um, Judge, I, I think we can finish um, in the next few minutes, and it it might help if Ms. McDonald didn't go on narratives um, with her answers to the questions. I object to the comment. Um, well, let's uh, just, just, just ask your next question, please. So Ms. McDonald, you, you agree that the photo is identical, but then when Mr. Broadcorp posted it, he didn't have this identifying information that we can see in exhibit eight. Absolutely. Yes, the answer. No identifying information. He just okay. posted this picture. Pardon me? He just posted the picture all over his website. It wasn't once, it wasn't twice. I, okay. He had posted it once, and when I protested, he posted it over and over and over again. To this day, he says he's, okay, still, but you, he's still threatening you, to post it. You agree that the photos are identical? They're identical, yes. And you're... Even though they're identical, you are claiming that Mr. Broadcorb obtained this photo from some unknown source. I didn't claim that. He told me where he obtained it from, arrestminnesota.org. Okay. So I contacted, he said, your photo is on arrestminnesota.org, some website like that. I contacted arrestminnesota.org gave them the copy of the, the dismissal order in the, uh, the file. I gave them a copy of the, uh, the judge's order that said I was not booked, not to be booked, or was needed a motion to be booked, and they took it down. And, and I didn't pay anything. I just told them, this is inappropriate. Arrest Minnesota.org. Take it down. And they took it down. I wasn't even made aware of it until broad started posting it. I was not aware that this was out in the in the in the world. Okay, and you heard Mr. Broadcorp testify earlier today that he obtained that photo from the Dakota County Sheriff's Office, correct? Well, he he did that much later. Uh, he said he obtained it from the Dakota County Sheriff's Office, but he told me when I uh, protested about the picture immediately when I saw him posting it, I asked him to take it down. He told me he got it from arrest.org. I went to the arrest.org website, and there it was. And I contacted the person there to please take it down, email. I sent them a the copy of a uh, order, uh, and I sent them a copy of uh, 
the uh, dismissal order and also that I wasn't booked and they took it down. They wrote me a letter and, and took it down. So, and he kept it up. Okay, but your, your claim that Mr. Broadcorb um, engaged in defamation uh, by using this photo on his website was not, did not survive summary judgment in court. Object as to what the court did. The no, decision, uh, decision. Yes, I and I think I think your statement is is true, counsel. But I don't think we need to uh, have her acknowledge it because, as I said, it's on the record. Okay, judge, I have no further questions. All right. Uh, so, are you going to rest then uh, with this examination? You don't have any other witnesses to call. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and Mr. Eng, um, uh, I'm assuming that uh, we could let her rest and then have you call your uh, your client as your first witness and do what you would do as a cross 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 examination uh, as a part of uh, of your case. Is that uh, acceptable? That's correct. And then I have these two witnesses I'd like to insert. Uh, you know, they're uh, both lawyers and. Um, one's at three and one at 315. I'd like to call them during the break and tell them to check in with Linda and then we could just get those on if it's okay with the court. I just promised them I'd get them in, that's all. Yes, and if you wanna get them in right away, you can, or, or I'll leave it up to you uh, where you wanna do it in the presentation of your case. So uh, why don't we take a 10 minute break? Uh, well, a little more than 10 minutes. It's two, about two, a little after 2.15, uh, let's go until 2.30 and uh, we'll resume uh, at that time. Once again, just uh, 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 please mute yourself and, uh, and take down your video. And then when you're ready to proceed at 2.30, uh, bring back up your video and we'll, we'll go from there. Okay? Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs>
Mr. Eng? Yes. Uh, I've got someone named Seben in the waiting room right now. Thank you. He's our first witness. I, I'm going to move him up instead of three o'clock. We'll just get him on. So. All right. You let me know when you'd like me to admit him. Thank you. Right after the court starts, but not until. So. It looks like uh, we have the, uh, we have critical mass. <laughs> so. Uh, what about Miss McDonald, Judge? I, she's here, I think, isn't she? Maybe not. Just want to make sure. I just talked to her, so. <laughs> Judge, we're gonna go with the lawyers first and I appreciate your courtesy on that. Okay, we'll wait till your client is uh, is with us, and uh, then you can call your next witness. Okay. I, I, and if, if Linda's there, when we're ready, Linda, just uh, put Mr. Seaman in, and we're ready to go. So. Okay. And uh, in the meantime, uh, Ms. McDonald, you can you can mute and close your video as long as we know that you're that you're with us. <clears throat> Okay, Mr. Eng, your next witness, please. Uh, Your Honor, uh, thank you very much. We call William Seaman on I behalf of I, McDonald's. I, I guess I should say you're not your next witness because you haven't called a witness yet. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I guess formally, uh, Ms. Ratnayaki, as we discussed, you are now uh, resting your case. Is that correct? Correct. All right. And I, and I think under the circumstances, I, I would reserve my motion to dismiss for further argument uh, after I get the witnesses in, if that's all right with you. That's fine. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Eng, uh, your first witness, please. Uh, we call William Seaman, please. And I know he's in a waiting room. Okay. He's actually been admitted. I can't okay. see him, though. I can see his... Uh, I can see that uh, he is checked in, but we need to see him in person and have him unmute. I think I've unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, now we need your uh, now we need your face, Bill. Okay. Oh, uh, oh, I think this works. There you go. <laughs> there we go. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. All right, uh, could we have the court reporter swear the witness, please? Sir, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. And uh, sir, if you would please give us your full name and spell it for the record. Sure, it's William, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-R, Sieben. S-I-E-B-E-N. All right. Counsel? Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Sieben, you're a lawyer in Minneapolis? I am. Would you tell us where you work and how long you've been a lawyer? Uh, I work at Schwebel Getz and Sieben, which is located at 80 South 8th Street in the IDS Center. Uh, I've been a practicing lawyer since April of 1977, so uh, 43 plus years. What does your firm do? Uh, we do uh, uh, personal injury litigation, wrongful death litigation, product liability litigation, and, uh, and some uh, class action work that I've done. And I assume the Sieben is you. You're the name partner of the firm. Am I right about that? Correct. Mr. Sieben, over the course of your career, uh, have you had a chance to meet and to work with uh, Michelle McDonald? 
I have, yes. Could you kind of give us a history of uh, your interactions with Ms. McDonald, if you would? Sure. Uh, I don't remember what year it was, but uh, Michelle was a young lawyer and she had a cable television show on the law and somehow she got to me and asked me if I would be a guest on her cable television show to talk about uh, injury law and accident law and tort law. And I, I did that uh, for her. And uh, I, I've known her uh, since that time. I think it was the late 80s. I, I think it was not, not long after she began practicing. In the course of your work uh, in personal injury, have you referred cases to her? I have, yeah, I referred a niece of mine, cl a close uh, relative, and uh, Michelle did an excellent job uh, for her. And has, uh, has Michelle referred cases to you and worked with you over the years? She has, yeah, especially like uh, in the late 80s to the late 90s or thereabouts, she would refer me a fair number of, of uh, serious injury cases and we work together on them. And, uh, and I haven't, uh, it's been quite some time since I've had a case from Michelle, but, uh, but yeah, I worked on a number of cases that she referred uh, for quite a few years. And did you enjoy a positive working relationship? with? Her? Yes, yes, it was a positive working relationship. Uh, she was very good with people uh, and with clients and uh, wanted to be involved. She, she didn't want to just hand off a case. She wanted to know what was going on and to be kept uh, up to date on you know how the clients were doing and you know what was happening so she was a, a very active uh, participant uh, uh, in those cases uh, over the years. Thank you. Uh, bringing you up to recent times did Ms. McDonald ask you for your assistance during her probation period, period probationary period uh, for her license? Yes she did. Uh, Asked me if I did. how that Start, how did that contact happen and what did you agree to do? Uh, well, I, I agreed to be uh, her supervisor, uh, which involved quarterly meetings over the course of her two year period of probation. Uh, and I met with her right, right after she asked and I you know, complied with the, the board's uh, uh, requests and uh, what they needed and what they wanted. Uh, so uh, I met with her at length right at the start and then as I say, quarterly uh, during the two-year period. When you say what the board wanted from you, did, what, what exactly were your obligations to the board as her supervisor? Well, it, they wanted me just to, to uh, uh, be confident that the cases she was handling, she was handling uh, in a professional manner. Uh, and so what I asked Michelle to do was to give me a quarterly listing, and she actually did it on a monthly basis, but of the cases she was handling. So I knew what they were and what was going on with them. And we'd talk about whether there were any uh, problem potentials uh, with those cases and, and talk it through. And uh, uh, so I, I did that, as I say, on a quarterly basis. And I was confident that throughout she was uh, doing a good job by uh, handling the cases that she was handling. I've got, got my file here and I was looking through it before you asked me to testify and I, I just see that she always had an active caseload. She's, she's always had a, a good following uh, um, with potential clients. And, and so during the two years I, that I uh, supervised, uh, I was impressed by the number of cases that she had and the and the significance of the cases uh, and, and how important they were to her clients and how important she took those cases. Uh, I, I was impressed with uh, how on top of things she was. During the course of your reporting to the board, um, were there any complaints lodged from the board's lawyers to you about Ms. McDonald's work or a particular case? No, no, the board never reported anything to me. I, I can't remember where it came from. It might've come from the board that there were two complaints, uh, but I, I didn't have anything to do with those. They didn't ask me to investigate or get to the bottom of anything uh, or to be an expert or a resource on 
the complaints that give rise to what's happening today that that was not something i had responsibility for so they didn't ask you to discuss them or try to resolve them in any way whatsoever i don't think so no not not that i recall and i'm looking back through my notes i don't see that that they asked that and during the course of the two years that you um supervised mcdonald miss mcdonald did you have any concerns about her practice that would cause you a pause no no i thought she was on top of things and uh, i thought she had the confidence of these clients uh, on a lot of family related matters uh, that can be quite testy, quite uh, problematic, but, but she seemed to have a, a, a good uh, feel for how to handle families in distressing situations. So overall, it was a positive two years experience for you and for Ms. McDonald together. I thought so, yes. No further questions, thank you. Uh, Cross-examination. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Steven. Hi. Hi. Uh, Mr. Steven, you mentioned that you reviewed uh, kind of Ms. McDonald's caseload with respect to cases she was handling on behalf of clients, correct? Right. Yes. Um, now, you're aware that Ms. McDonald filed a lawsuit during the time that she was on probation um, that she filed a lawsuit on behalf of her law firm and on behalf of herself, correct? You know, I really didn't get into that. I think I became aware of it, but that was not something that I was asked to get involved in. Uh, and that seemed to me to be just a political uh, matter rather than a, than a professional matter. So okay. it did, I was not asked to get involved in that. And uh, my politics and Michelle's don't align uh, that, that may not surprise anybody, but, but, uh, but I, I wasn't involved on a, in this for any political reason. It was just strictly professional. So, uh, I viewed that as, as political. Okay. So, but at, in your role as probation supervisor, she didn't come to you first and discuss that she wanted to file a lawsuit you know, a defamation lawsuit and kind of discuss the merits or the out specific allegations that she wanted to make with you. No, no, that's okay. not something. And that's not something that I would have ventured into. Uh, because as I say, that, that just seems political, not professional. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Steven. I, I don't have any further questions for you. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Redirect. Uh, no, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, you're excused. Thank you, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. I'll see if I can get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Your right, Honor, uh, I have Larry Frost, and he told me he would be checking in at 2.40, so perhaps he's here. Ms. Nelson? Uh, there's no one in the waiting room right now. Well, I can, um, you know, he's going to be here in a second. I can assure you of that. So what would okay. the court's preference be? Well, um, I would like to uh, briefly continue on the record. Um, the conversation I started, uh, I guess, during the lunch break. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, about um, the examination of Mr. Broadcorp about his more recent um, postings and um, my view that they're probably not relevant and your argument mr ang was that they they go to his bias as a witness uh which would presumably relate to impeaching his testimony in some way but i went back and looked at the uh at the uh, um the petition filed by the board and um it really relates to the um accuracy or um uh, not the accuracy, but uh, the legitimacy of the uh, um, of the the complaint that was filed uh, and ultimately uh, decided and, and on summary judgment and then by the the court of appeals. Um, and uh, you said, uh, I think in uh, in our brief discussion that that it showed that uh, that the testimony showed that uh, Mr. Broadcorp was still. 
um, still had a lot of animus and that there was a lot of animus between these parties. I, I think that's true, but I don't know exactly what issue that goes to um, uh, because I, I don't uh, think that uh, his testimony um, regarding that issue um, is, is particularly relevant to whether or not there was uh, the, uh, the complaint was well, well founded. Um, and uh, so I, my feeling about this is that uh, uh, even though you may disagree, I don't think it will be appropriate to get into things uh, uh, with your next witness or witnesses um, with, with your client uh, regarding ongoing disputes and, and ongoing animus between the parties because I, I truly do not think that that is uh, relevant to the issues that I have before me. I don't know if you want to address that or uh, at this um, time. I do note my objection, Your Honor. Number one, there was no objection to the inquiry. Um, so the, the, the director waived any objection to it. And it's so spontaneous that the court's making a, uh, a decision that was not brought to the court's attention by the board. But more, more importantly, it's the question for you one of the questions for you is whether she had a good faith basis to file a complaint alleging defamation by implication. And what I was getting at with Mr. Broadcourt were the implications of his phrasing, which is consistent throughout time. I just happened to pick something that was more recent because it was quite vivid. And he, ex he, he expressed that this is consistent with what he's been doing. He's alleging criminal complicity criminal conspiracy of Ms. McDonald with these other people. And it is um, defamation by implication. And I was trying to explain the tort, which is a unique tort, but one that she litigated in good faith. And so um, that's what I was trying to get to. And uh, moreover, the witness claimed uh, that he was fault faultless in all ways. And I was trying to illustrate that what he wrote, which was consistent with what he's always written, was harmful to someone's reputation and was right. defamatory. And it gives you a sense of why the complaint was filed in the first place. Right, so, but, uh, but, but I, the, the things that, excuse me, the things that you were re that you in inquired about uh, that post-dated her complaint would not be relevant to whether or not uh, it was, uh, uh, they were well-founded um, at the time of the filing of the complaint. That's that's my sure. observation. And I just, I, I just, um, think that uh, uh, you probably should not spend a lot of time going into post filing um, uh, events in your examination, but it's your examination and that's just a, sort of an advisory ruling. It's not a, it, it's, it's not a, uh, uh, it's not a ruling that will preclude you from asking what you want to ask. So you can go ahead and do it, but it's, it's just the way I see things at this point, subject to whatever arguments you want to make in the future. Okay, well, I, I'll stay away from it with Ms. McDonald, rest assured. I need to, I, Mr. Uh, Frost is calling you right now, if I may. Okay. Is this you, Larry? Can you? Well. Uh, may it please the court, uh, wonderful thing, cell phones. He, he couldn't get on the link and um, um, I could, I told him we'd come back to him at 3.15. Try again. How's that? You're, you're on, you're on. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's fine. I, I, you know, I think if he tries again or we can I'm not sure what else I can do. I can have Linda call him, but uh, let's, let's. 
Um, I'd like to move the, the ship ahead, so to speak. So Yeah, the, the other thing that I would point out is that for some reason, uh, I could not get into the, um, the Zoom through the court website. Remember, I had to go through my own Gmail account, and, and uh, that's where I am now housed. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that I that I do have the court uh, my my uh, my email open so that I can see the exhibits, but uh, perhaps uh, he might be able to um, to get onto the Zoom by using a different um, a different email address. Just a suggestion. Okay. Well, I can text. I can try. If I can text. Well, I. Let's pause at 3.15, I'll call him. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll work through this. I think he's having the same problem you had, but. Okay. Okay, let's, we'll call Michelle McDonald then. All right. And uh, Ms. Uh, McDonald, when you unmute and show us your face, um, I will remind you that you are still under oath. Did you hear me? Did you, you hear, hear us, Michelle? I am on. I am unmuted, and you reminded me that I'm still under oath. Thank you. Okay. Right. Okay, Mr. Ang, you can proceed. Thank you, and uh, Michelle, we're going to go for about 25 minutes, and then we'll try to get Larry back on here. Okay. Let me start with uh, your career, Ms. McDonald, uh, and kind of go through your resume, and then we'll get to the allegations quickly. Um, you're admitted. Uh, in Minnesota, and what was the year of your admission? Do you remember? It was 1986. Where did you go to law school? I went to Suffolk University Law School. And where did you go to? And where did you go in undergrad? Pardon me. Undergrad. Boston College. Okay. Is your family out in the Boston area still? Yes, they are. Okay. All right. Um, have you had any judicial experience in the course of your career uh, working as a referee? Yes, I have. Could you explain that to us? Uh, 22 years as a adjunct referee in family court and uh, a conciliation court judge deciding hundreds of small claims court cases. And which I did arbitrations as well. Uh, which county was that in, Ms. McDonald? It was in Hennepin. Were? In Hennepin County. Was the last year you uh, worked in Hennepin County 2014? Yes. Have you been lead counsel on over 60 appellate decisions in the course of your career? Yes, I have. You've also run for office, have you not? I have. And what offices have you run for? I ran for the Minnesota Supreme Court. Was that in 2014? Yes, yeah, statewide, I ran in 2014. I was asked to run. Uh, of course, being a small claims court judge, I had always had aspirations uh, to move on, but I was so um, astute at appeals, and I decided, hey, I'll uh, run for an appellate court position, and that's what I love to do. I love to research, and I love to write. And did you do well in the election? Percentage wise? I did very well. That year I was Republican endorsed and I did very well. It was about 47% of the vote. And uh, of all the Republicans, I got the highest percentage. So I was pretty proud of that. And since 2014, you've also run a couple more times for Associate Judge of the uh, Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court. Is that right? I have. I have. And you're running right now, as I understand it, in the election for this fall. Right? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Now, in the course of your uh, practice, have you uh, uh, established a nonprofit um, to facilitate a family law, family law, and family dispute resolutions? Yes, in 2011. I founded Family Innocence. It's a nonprofit that's dedicated to keeping families out of court and resolving conflicts and injustices peacefully. So that's what we do as best we can. And what do you do for the nonprofit? I am a volunteer president and I also do 
a restorative mediation in family circles. I'm also an educator. I just uh, actually uh, developed a 46 hour restorative circle mediation training that was approved by the uh, ADR, a judicial branch of the Supreme Court. And I taught, uh, I, I taught 25 new restorative mediators. We created a new uh, realm of mediation. There's, of course, I could go on and on, but there's a valuative mediation, there's narrative mediation, there's transformative mediation, and now we have uh, in this facilitative mediation. And now in Minnesota, we have a new creation, and it's called uh, restorative circle mediation. And we do our mediations in circle where uh, people come together and they actually communicate uh, with each other. Uh, we facilitate the communication and, uh, 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 and they actually understand each other. It's, it's amazing. And uh, my, my course, uh, I, uh, Judge Aleski, I think m many people know him, taught the course with me, but it's some, a course that I developed and we had a, a psychologist and we had six or seven professors, so to speak, and, and 24 students. And uh, it, it's a wonderful, a wonderful uh, thing that's happened for the state of Minnesota. We now have a, a new realm of, of mediation. Is the idea behind the program that you've established to, for the litigants to stay out of court and reach a resolution without conflict? Yes, and they do. They are, yeah, they do. It's it's pretty amazing. Uh, the the process. Uh, sometimes I call them the pure family innocence process, where they just come to us, and we can keep them out of court. And other times, it's the hairiest cases that come to us, and we do the circle thing, and uh, it, it it works. Once people um, start to communicate heart to heart. And not just the words, but the meaning behind the words. Uh, miracles happen. Are you also in the Amdahl Inns of Court? I'm in the Amdahl Inns of Court. Yes. And how long have you been in the Inns of Court? Uh, probably since 2011, 2012. Have you received uh, pro bono awards for your work in the community and the legal system? Yes, I have. And what are what are those? Well, there's um, the uh, North Star. Uh, every year they do a pro bono, uh, an acknowledgement of attorneys who have done uh, their minimum pro bono. And I usually have done, I don't know, several times that. <laughs> so uh, I've been uh, honored each, time, each year. So you've been honored in 2013 through 2019, am I right? Right. And in addition to the career highlights that I mentioned, you presented at very, you lectured, you presented, you've taught uh, in the area of family law over the course of your 33 year career. Am I right about that? Oh yes, yes, I have. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I'm. I I don't have it in front of me, but I could. Well, that's all right. I've got. I, I'm. We're just summarizing your resume. But let me let me ask you this: When you were uh, you were, we just heard from uh, Bill Seven. You were on probation with Bill. Mm -hmm. How did you pick Bill? Well, I I don't remember uh, exactly how. Uh, I, I know Judge Lesky, I was he was actually mediating one of my cases and he set me aside and said, how you doing? And I'm like, I'm okay. And he uh, had suggested some people he knew that supervised. I'm not really, I would have, this has never happened to me before. It hadn't happened to any of my colleagues. So I didn't know how it worked that I had to pick or at least uh, pick my own supervisor. But I had to, Bill had to be vetted by the board, and he was. So he was my uh, uh, supervisor for two years. Thank you, Bill, because he's, he was awesome just for volunteering. They don't get paid to, to uh, get me um, 
going and keep me in practice for two years. He was a great guy. And I had to actually uh, uh, do monthly reports to him. So they were pretty extensive. I took a lot of time doing my monthly reports. We had conversations. Uh, and then I had to meet with him in person every uh, uh, couple of months. So it was, uh, I, I spent a lot of time uh, presenting all of my cases and the things I was doing to Bill. Were you aware of any board complaints forward to, to Bill or any concerns that the board had that Bill required you to speak to him about? When the complaints, uh, when the Broadcorp complaint came in, I went over it with Bill, and when the Potvin complaint came in, I went over it with Bill, and right away I went over it with him, and uh, I know I prepared a response um, through through you, Paul, when the, and when the CCO radio came in. I talked to him ab about the complaints, yes, I did, and... And even towards the end of my suspension, because these complaints were uh, two years ago now, um, my suspension was coming up. I was meeting with Bill for the last time. It was it was almost March. It was March uh, 20th. Uh, my suspension was going to my I'm sorry, not my suspension. I was only suspended for six months, but my probation was going to be up in two years. I was very excited about that. Um, and I met with Bill and. I asked him, I said, has the board said anything about these other complaints? You know, because they were, they were just sitting there. We had responded. They never said a peep for two years. Nobody talked, nobody asked me about the CCO radio any further. Nobody asked me about the um, pot bin any further. Nobody asked me about the uh, a defamation lawsuit any further for two years. And I, and he's, and uh, I said, is there anything I need to do? And he said, oh, no, if you haven't heard from them, he says, I haven't heard anything about it. He said, good luck, congratulations. And, and then just before my probation ended, a couple of days before I'm at my office and somebody comes up and serves me papers, a filing with the Supreme Court that I'm, I'm going to lose my license. So it was... I'm so, I didn't expect to get emotional. I'm sorry. But okay, let me, let me that's stop how you they, there. They, they operated. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get well, emotional. Let me stop you there, Michelle, and ask you the next question. But let me let me try to direct you a little bit. I know it's quite emotional for you. <clears throat> did you also have some involvement in uh, with Larry Frost in supervising you? And how did that occur? Yes. Larry Frost, I, I hardly knew. I, the, the board seemed to be wanting me to have somebody that I didn't know because I had, uh, um, I think Judge Oleski uh, had his daughter <laughs> ask the board to be my supervisor. They rejected her, and there was someone else. Um, there's a legally blind attorney. He had... Uh, well, let's, let's go to Larry, though. How okay. did you get to so We'll go to Larry. So I, I contacted Larry. And he, he agreed to be my supervisor and was also vetted by the board. Uh, and he was a daily supervisor. The order said that I needed daily supervision. So that was Larry. And for two years, Larry and I, I connected very, very well. And sometimes I work the weekends, so I'd have to email him and talk to him on the weekends. But we connected every single day for two years. Okay. All right. Now, um, let me ask you uh, about the allegations that have been made against you and get your response to them. Fair enough? Okay. Sure. <clears throat> we'll start with Mr. Potvin. Do you recall him walking through your door? Yes, I do. Did he have an appointment? No, he was a walk-in. And you have a, an office on Robert Street, uh, south of downtown. It's sort of a house that has a sign out in front. And that's how I found out about it. Apparently. Yeah, it's, it's a, how, it was a house I converted to, to offices right on Robert Street. So we get walk-ins, um, not 
so much with COVID, but we get walk-ins quite regularly. And, and if, if we have an attorney available, we'll sit and have a, a conversation with them about um, what, if they have a case or not. So he came in and discussed a, a, a case with you. Do you remember what the case was about? It was a personal injury case. So he, he actually came in and uh, he told me he had filed, he had filed the personal injury case because I went on Mensis and I looked and it had been dismissed. And he explained to me he had some paperwork or maybe he didn't have all his paperwork that day that he wanted to have it uh, uh, take me, me take a look at it. He was looking for an attorney. T attorneys had rejected his case. So he told me that nobody will take my case. <laughs> and I have a little bit of a bleeding heart. So I'm just like, well, you know, it seems like you might have a case, a slip and fall type case. It was a landlord tenant. And so I sat down with him. And then uh, Carlova Powell has done several uh, personal injury cases. I even thought of sending it to Bill. Um, and Bill, I know he testified earlier. He, when I send him a case now, he has me send them to his his nephew. So that's why Bill hasn't been getting uh, referrals these days because he's he takes on the bigger cases. But this was a, a slip and fall case, and I I. Uh, he did want me to open a file for him, and that's what we've regularly done to keep track because we're a busy law firm to keep track of our clients. We'll have them fill out right when they come in a, uh, a sheet with their name, their address, why they're there, and uh, we don't accept any money. We just have a free consultation. Sometimes those are a half an hour. Sometimes they're an hour. Sometimes they're longer than that. And then okay, I just uh, let me enter, let me uh, ask you another question. This fifty dollars to this fifty dollar fee. When did that come? In? This fifty dollar administrative cost. When did that come into play? It comes in the 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 meeting. So if after the meeting, the clients uh, are want us to keep track because sometimes a client might call me a year or two, and and of course I have a procedure that if for $50, so it's not a legal fee, it's an admin fee, and it's worked out quite well, we actually take the information and open up a file, not a legal file, but a file so that if they ever call back or if they're emailing us information and they haven't uh, decided whether to retain us yet, that we have a place to put it. It's been very efficient, actually. And so that's what we do instead of, you know, just putting it, in with a big pile of other people. And I, some people do not decide to do that. They say, no, you know, you don't have to open a file. I'll just call you later or, or contact you. But the, the ones that are serious about having us help them will typically do that so that they go and get the information and, they, and we have, we can just access their file relatively quickly. So what happened is that he paid you fifty dollars. You you accepted the administrative fee, mm -hmm. which was not a lawyer's fee. It wasn't for a lawyer's time. Mm -hmm. And then you entered into an agreement to represent him, which is in Exhibit Fifteen, correct? Right. Okay, but right. that wasn't on the first day you saw him, was it? No, no, it wasn't. What happened was, and this was why I think he was a little confused. So he had paid the $50, then he was waiting for the retainer. And when he talks about Carloba being gone, I needed to contact Carloba. I mean, we don't just, I just don't assume somebody wants to help me with a case and see if she was interested in the case, what her schedule was, whether she, you know, our meeting times. So that takes some time and he was a little anxious. He did, uh, from what I understand, he told me he had a brain injury. So what did, I- what did, he, what did he tell you about his brain injury? He said he had fell and hit his head and he was going through, uh, it, this was the slip and fall and he, he had the medical records to show it and he had hit his head and he was going through, he had a brain injury. So, so and that he was going through some therapies for that. So he had, uh, medical bills and things like that that were being paid uh, probably through insurance. I don't remember the, the details, but that was the injury. 
And so I don't think he remembered that when I said I'm going to get him the retainer and give it to him, that it was it was going to be blank, basically. We were going to sit there and meet and go over, you know, this is what it's going to cost, or are you okay with it? And go over, I go over the retainers line by line with people. And I, I if Carlova was there, I would have said, well, we're going to be sharing the fee. And uh, usually we sh it would be a 50-50. So in this case, it was different, and I apologize for that. Um, I must have, so I must have told him what it was. And let so- me, Let me back up then. Uh, let me stop you just, just for a second, Ms. McDonald. So the, this fee agreement in Exhibit 15 <clears throat> is something that you read to him on the day in question, June 5th. You take my word for it, it's June 5th, 2018, correct? Right, I okay. met with him that same day. All right, now his contention is that you never gave him a copy of this agreement that day. What is your practice with respect to retainer agreements and giving them to the clients and to Mr. Potvin personally? It is always to give the clients a copy, whether I think I had one recently that said, I said, uh, here's a copy. She said, no, I don't need it. You can have it. I said, no, you're going to take a copy of this. So I insist on them getting a copy of the retainer. I don't, I don't see my retainers as cookie cutter. We're just going to hear sign here. And yeah, I, I really go over them with people. I don't, it's, you know, he could have walked away. I, I'm not a pressure person. Uh, yeah, but let, me ask you, let me ask you this, McDonald. The, the fee agreement, um, Mr. Potvin testified that he thought the fee agreement was just, just for taking the entire case. What was your understanding of the fee agreement as it's reflected in Exhibit 15? Oh, he, he was very much aware. We're not, we're not going to take his entire case for $500, a slip and fall case. It, it says right on the agreement, and that's why I wrote it so specifically. Re I try to be as specific as pro possible. Review data provided for PI. He was going to provide more data. I believe he had brought some uh, for us to put in the file, and then he was going to get some more data. And then ends July when, when reviews completed. So we were going to give ourselves till July 1, and sometimes it could go over that, but it said specifically, this retainer ends July 1 when our review is completed. And then I also have a line that said, uh, says uh, that um, and any additional legal advice or tasks may require a separate fee and representation agreement. So sometimes these, these reviews, these flat fees, uh, we, 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 we take. And, and I've been to seminars about the flat fees. So... Uh, they're 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 being more and more um, um, accepted, I guess, especially in family law. Um, let me. Our, let me let I would me. want another. I'd have another agreement. Sometimes uh, we we do. Sometimes we don't. <clears throat> well, let me ask you this, Miss McDonald. Then um, this is his signature on the bottom of uh, Exhibit 15, page 221. Correct. Okay. Right. And Carlova Powell was in the room when you negotiated this with him, right? Right. He agreed to uh, to pay you for a review of the case, right? Right. Okay. And the, the question is, um, he acknowledges in his handwriting on the second page of here that of this fee, you'll get $300 and Carlova Powell will get $200. <clears throat> was that made clear to him when he paid his $500? It was made clear to him, and even his notes say paid $500, 6 5 18, and it says 300 Michelle, 200 Carlova. So I don't see what issue the board has with it. His own notes, and he testified right on this, says paid $500, 6 5 18, and then 300 250 now, the other, remember, he, when I gave him his file, he took the whole thing and had this retainer. So these other notes he might, might have put afterwards, uh, these other notes about other things. But that is very clear that uh, he paid 500 on 6 5 18, 300 to Michelle, 200 to Carloba, and 50 to open the file. 
He didn't pay, he paid that earlier. Eventually, um, no suit was brought uh, by either Carloba Powell or yours, <coughs> excuse me, or, sorry, Your Honor, or yourself. How did the relationship end with Mr. Potvin? Well, uh, we, Carloba and I, did decide to take his case. We said, okay. we'll take your case. Uh, and we were going to do a contingency fee. Okay. Uh, this is my is bleeding cold. heart again. And, and then he determined, he, he might, I believe he read something in the newspaper. And then he asked us, he, he discharged us. We didn't discharge him. We actually were talking to him about taking the case on contingency. And so, uh, it's, it's kind of sad that he didn't, uh, come back because uh, obviously nobody is interested in his case. I, I think these slip and falls are not of interest to a lot of attorneys. Did you, and he mentioned that Ms. Powell had a conflict of interest with someone. Did you ever discuss that with him? No, he said that afterwards when we were in our first meeting, I think uh, he, he, when he said the name of the defendant, his landlord, his landlord has a stand, like a hot dog stand. And Carloba lives in St. Paul and she has an office there as well. So uh, she said, oh, that's the guy at the hot dog stand. So Carloba didn't know him. She knew of him from the hot dog stand because he, he, would, he was there for years and years. So they, they weren't friends. They, they weren't even acquaintances. He just owns a hot dog stand. So this might be part of what he's, the confusion that he has. Obviously, Carloba, we wouldn't take the case if it was Carloba's friend that, that he wanted to sue. That would be not right. Uh, we would never, any, I would never do that. Did you have any safety concerns about him or acting out concerns about Mr. Potvin? So after, yes, uh, it, it was, other members in the, in the office, I, I guess I didn't because I wasn't privy to directly to the safety concerns, but I know um, uh, Carloba was uh, uh, talking to him on the phone and he was making some threats, not towards us, he, 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 but towards the landlord. You know, he was saying this, uh, he was getting... I mean, we hadn't even really started the case. We had just reviewed it, and he was saying, "I should just," um, and I, I don't, I don't want to make, I don't want to say the words, but she started to think he might be dangerous, yeah. and uh, somebody overhearing a conversation in our office said, "Huh? Do we Judge, really?" Judge, I object us to their relevance. Um, this does not go to the allegations that are alleged in the petition regarding Mr. Potvin. Sustained. All right. <clears throat> I think that concludes my questions with Mr. Pop. And Your Honor, can I take a short break and call Mr. Uh, Frost and see if he's connected or what's the, he's calling me right now again. Can I talk to him or? Sure. Yeah. Sure, you can mute yourself and we'll just wait. Larry? There's somebody in the waiting room. Uh, Judge, apparently he's in the waiting room, so he got here. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing, since we're at a pause with my topics with Ms. McDonald, if I could deal with Mr. Frost for 10 minutes, and I think that would be helpful. Okay, uh, we'll take a, a 10 minute break. And, no, I, uh, no, I don't need a break. He's here. Um, but I think his testimony being 10 to 15 minutes. I see. Okay. <laughs> I just want to, I know this is a little disjointed, but the lawyers, uh, you know, are, are kind enough to testify. I'd like to accommodate them. So. No, that's, that's fine. Uh, Ms. Nelson, do we have, do we have him uh, ready to go? Yes, he's in the waiting room. I'll admit him now. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much.
I believe that unmutes me, Mr. Ng. Can you uh, hear me? I can hear you, Larry. Now you got to get on the video, I think. There we go. That should get me on video. There you go. Okay. <laughs> I apologize to the court for calling in, but uh, I didn't know how else to uh, make these technical connections. Okay, that's fine. Um, uh, then, uh, Mr. Ng, do you want to um, call your witness and then we'll have him sworn? Thank you, John. <clears throat> we, we call out of order Larry Frost. All right. Uh, <laughs> where did he go? Oh, there he is. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, uh, the court reporter will swear the witness, please. Sir, if you will please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Thank you. Okay, um, sir, <clears throat> could you please give us your full name and spell it for the record? Larry Allen Frost, L-A-R-R-Y. A-L-A-N-F-R-O-S-T. Thank you, Mr. Rainey, you can proceed. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Frost, you're a, a lawyer licensed to practice in the state of Minnesota? That's correct. How long have you been a lawyer? I've been a lawyer since um, 2009, 2009. Uh, <clears throat> before then you had a career in the military as I understand it. That's correct. Would you describe that uh, for the court? Uh, I served as an enlisted man in the Marines and then an enlisted man at 2nd Airborne Ranger Battalion. They sent me to OCS. I was commissioned and served a total of 27 years, mostly in military intelligence. And when did you uh, leave the military? 2004, Mr. Ring. Thereafter, you, it sounds like you attended law school. Uh, yes, at uh, 59, I was the second oldest person in my law school class. <laughs> And then you graduated, what, in 2008 or 2009? 2009, Mr. Ring. Okay. And you've been a practicing lawyer ever since, correct? Uh, I have been a practicing lawyer ever since, but I actually had my last case in July. I have retired, but I, my license is still active. Okay. Mr. Frost, I've asked you to, to come to, <laughs> and uh, discuss your involvement with uh, Ms. McDonald in uh, her probationary term, and I'm, those are the questions I'd like to ask you about. How did you meet Ms. McDonald and become involved as her supervisor? Actually, I had two glancing uh, meetings with Ms. McDonald at political functions, and then at one point we had lunch because we were both interested in, in potential family court reform. So those are the only three meetings I had before she called and asked me if I would uh, consider supervising her under paragraph 5C of her disciplinary order. Did you accept her invitation? I did. And what, what was your understanding of what you had to do under five paragraph 5C of the, of the court's order? Well, I had to, the, the one thing that's very clear is that I had to sign all submissions she made to a court. Uh, that's very clear. But things got very unclear after that because when I asked to meet with the uh, Office of Lawyers Professional Responsibility, uh, Ms. Cassie Hansen told me that there'd never been a paragraph 5C order like that before. Of course, I didn't, don't know. I've never been involved with these. Uh, and basically said that I was not representing OLPR, which is correct. Uh, and I didn't have to report to OLPR because the order didn't say so. Uh, and there was no other guidance. So together, she and I worked out that I would report to OLPR as a courtesy, uh, that I would do so monthly. Uh, I later added a quarterly report to, to match Mr. Stevens. Uh, and we kind of felt our way along after that. Um, I, I volunteered to do it basically because I felt it was my duty as a lawyer to help in these kinds of cases. How often did you have contact with Ms. McDonald throughout her probationary period? Well, frequently. It's not, it wasn't always daily. It was daily in terms of email because I required her to email me daily and give a listing of what contacts she'd had and what work she had done. But we didn't always speak daily. Um, monthly, I got a list of her cases uh, it's similar to the one she prepared for Mr. Steven. And then we spoke frequently, but I, I can't tell you how often because it was irregular. And Multiple were, times a week, at least. How often were you in touch with the board? Um, as I felt it was necessary, I, I had agreed with Ms. Hansen to submit biweekly and later it was changed to monthly summaries, which I did. Um, and I also contacted someone at the board, depending on what the issue was, whenever I felt it was necessary. Well, we have three complaints that we're dealing with uh, at our hearing today. Did, 
did the, the port the board ever contact you concerning uh, their interest in a complaint by an individual named Potvin? Does this ring a bell with you? Can you spell that for me, please? The video is a little blurry. P O T V I N. I think I'd remember that. It sounds Russian. I don't believe so, but the name does sound vaguely familiar. I might have read it somewhere else. Did the, <clears throat> did the board uh, similarly contact you with it regarding any concern about a WCCO interview that Ms. McDonald gave uh, during the election cycle of 2018? I don't recall them contacting me about that directly. I think it may have been discussed or come up incidentally in some other conversations we had. Again, this is quite a while ago. I mean, Did the board ask you to address their concerns with Ms. McDonald concerning that interview with CCO, if you recall? No, not that I recall. And finally, uh, the last issue that we've been discussing um, is a complaint that Ms. <clears throat> McDonald filed against Michael Broadcorp. You are familiar with that, are you not? I am, yes. Were you required by Rule 5C to place your signature in that complaint? I was, and there was some delay in doing that because when that complaint was prepared, I was actually on vacation out of country, um, but I ultimately did so, yes. Okay, and eventually was your name removed from the complaint and a, a lawyer's name substituted in? Yes, it was. Okay, and who was the lawyer's uh, that was substituted in? Oh, you know, I don't remember her name. Uh, Let me help you with that. I mean, was it Karlova Powell that would that be yes. familiar to you? Yes, it was Karlova Powell. I had, I, I apologize to the court again. I had to use a different computer than my law computer to get on this line. And so the materials I had prepared to refer to are, aren't available on this computer. Okay. Um, <clears throat> throughout the duration of the two years you had with Ms. Uh, McDonald, was she compliant with all your requests? Always. It, was she prompt in answering your questions if you had any and answering your concerns if you raised them? The only problem I had with Ms. McDonald's responses was they were often too voluminous. Yes, she was very prompt and gave me everything I asked for. Okay, all right. <clears throat> and uh, in, in filing this broad court complaint, uh, did you feel uh, as if Ms. Um, McDonald had a good faith basis to do what she was doing? I did. Um, although I approached it uh, from the point of view of someone who was just signing the complaint, not from someone who was, for example, reviewing another, a law partner's work to see if it was somehow lacking in tactical, proper tactics or anything. I, I, again, I viewed my, my role as signing the complaint to ensure that the kinds of things that were the cause of the disciplinary action did not recur. Thank you very much, Mr. Frost. No further questions. Frost examination. Good afternoon, Mr. Frost. Good afternoon, Ms. Retnayaki. Uh, Mr. Frost, you mentioned that you were not contacted by the board regarding um, two of the complaints that were filed uh, regarding Ms. McDonald. Is that correct? I said I didn't recall doing that. I did not recall that, correct. Okay. And would you agree that as part of your role as a probation supervisor, you were not asked to participate in the investigation of new complaints um, um, that came forward? I need to make a, a technical correction. I was not the probation supervisor. That was Mr. Sieben. There was no title for what I was under paragraph 5C of the disciplinary order. And as I said, Ms. Hansen told me it was uh, sui generis. So, but other than that, no, I was not asked to participate. Uh, answering the substance of your question, I was not asked to participate in your investigations that I recall. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, and then, Mr. Frost, you mentioned that when Ms. Uh, McDonald prepared the complaint, uh, the, the defamation complaint against Mr. Broadcorb, that you were out of the country at the time, correct? I was out of the country when I was asked to sign it. I don't know when she started preparing it. Okay, and is it correct that because you were out of the country, you were not able to kind of thoroughly review the allegations that Ms. Uh, McDonald had raised in that complaint? I, 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 would, I was able to thoroughly review the complaint. I, I had email uh, spottily from the point of view that I expected my duties required. Again, I did not review it as I would, for example, 
if I had uh, an associate attorney that was working for me, uh, I didn't review it in that way or with that kind of point of view. I was reviewing her complaint to see if it appeared to me to reflect the kinds of errors that the Supreme Court disciplined Ms. McDonald for, and that only. For example, if I thought there was bad tactics, I wouldn't have told her that. That's, that wasn't my role as far as I could tell. Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Frost. May I? You're muted, Your Honor. I know. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, may Mr. I, Your Honor? Redirect. redirect. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Frost, would it be fair to say that um, you wanted Ms. McDonald to succeed at her probation? Of course. And that I, I viewed that as my charge from the Supreme Court. I don't think the Supreme Court approaches these issues with malice. Okay. And um, had you thought that what she was doing would not lead to her success, you would have blocked, uh, for example, the complaint or anything else that she was doing uh, for her own good, I assume. Uh, well, I might have been for her own good. Again, I, I viewed myself as working for the Supreme Court. I was not working for Ms. McDonald. I certainly was not working for the Officer of Lawyer's Professional Responsibility, as was made clear in our first meeting. So I viewed my duty as lying to the Supreme Court and the profession as a whole, not to Ms. McDonald. And you believe you did that, of course. I did that to the best of my ability, Mr. Ring. No one's questioning that, but I wanted to ask the question. So. Understood. I have no further questions. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Any further recross, counsel? Uh, no, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Frost, you're excused. Thank you, Your Honor. Thanks, Mr. Frost, appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we can reconnect Ms. McDonald and you can continue with your examination. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you hear me, Ms. McDonald? I can hear you. Okay, let's uh, go to the CCO interview, and then we'll end with the complaint against Mr. Broadcourt. Uh, were you invited by Mr. Blois Olson to be on the radio that day? Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. were, did you solicit this invitation at all? Pardon me? Did you solicit the invitation at all? No, I did not. I was invited. Did he give you topics that he was going to ask you about before you got on the radio? No, he did not. I, I, he just asked whatever questions he wanted to ask. And were you appearing as a candidate for the justice position of the Supreme Court? Yes, like I said, it was about four weeks before the election. Right. It was in October and the election was November 6th last, last time. And he asked you a series of questions about the Grazzini Rocky case. Isn't that correct? He did. That was his that was his initial focus, it seems to me, after reading the transcript. Am I right about that? Seemed to be the case, yes. Okay. And you were um, if you follow along with me, I'm gonna uh, ask you what you meant by certain questions and answers, and I'm looking at page 67, which is page two of the transcript. Do you have that in front of you, Ms. McDonald? Could you give me the page number? 67. Maybe Cascini can give it to me. What, what was that? 67. 67, okay. Uh, okay, 67, got it. Oh. Still there? Okay. Now, okay, and he's he's asking you um, about on the on the top paragraph. One of the cases you have been involved with is uh, Sandra Grazzini Rocky. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and he's talking about her civil rights being violated, and then he asks you to explain why her civil rights were violated. Is that correct? Right. And then you, uh, in turn, um, mention and 
take issue with the idea that um, you were made to handle the trial of the case of her custody while under arrest. Is that correct? Right. Uh, yeah. I was arrested, handcuffed. I was, arre I was ar arrested. I was in shock, first of all, because I didn't even know I was arrested. But apparently, I was arrested, brought into a room, handcuffed. Uh, uh, they put a belt around my waist, took my glasses, my shoes, all of my jewelry, my jacket. Uh, and then I was uh, seated in a wheelchair and brought back to finish up the trial. Right. And then I actually was... did the trial in handcuffs, which a lot of people don't realize. They, I got arrested in court. Okay, that's one thing. But to actually be under arrest and complete a trial and then have a break and they, then they brought me back, it's very, uh, uh, it, I think it was, it was done to humiliate me. And it certainly did. So you discussed that on the radio, mm -hmm. and then you discussed as well that you had sued uh, Judge Knutson in federal court. Is that right? Right. The lawsuit had happened. It was the day before my arrest. So uh, we had filed the lawsuit on September 11th, 2013. That was the first. It was he. Uh, there was warnings uh, prior to uh, to uh, judge to. David Knutson and all of the does uh, by color of law warnings. So they did get the lawsuit and he was, uh, it was the, the day of the trial or the day before. And we, we went, to, I asked him to remove himself because we had just sued him in federal court or I, I didn't sue him at the time. I, I didn't sue him. It was my client. I was suing on behalf of my client. Uh, I asked him to remove himself because there was a federal lawsuit against him and he didn't remove himself. We proceeded with day one of the trial. And then uh, on day two, during a break, I was arrested. All right. Then you know, we had that, that whole trial was subject to our last um, disciplinary hearing. But I want to ask you what you stated next on the CCO interview, if I could. He asked you, Mr. Boyce asked, Olson asks you um, whether or not Sandra Grazini Rucky's rights were, quote, violated by the court. Okay. Right. He doesn't ask you, he asks you about her particular rights. Isn't that correct? Right. All right. And <clears throat> you go on to say in your response that. Um, that on September of 2012, without any hearing, let me stop there. Was to your knowledge, Sandra <laughs> Grazini Rucky at any hearing on that day in September 12th, that was a apparently a telephone call hearing? No, she was not. Do you know if she was ever, do you know if she was invited to even be at the hearing? I have no knowledge. I don't call that a hearing. <laughs> I don't. Okay. It's a, phone I, I, call. it's a telephone conference. I'll get that in a second. They even, yeah, it says a telephone yeah. conference. So, yeah, these, these questions, no, she, as far as I know, because when I got her, she was already subject to the order. I didn't meet her until January 1. That order was implemented on January, uh, what, was it 7th? Right. Well, to your knowledge, Ms. McDonald, was she invited to that telephone conference or did she participate in any way in that telephone conference? She wasn't invited. I don't know if she was invited, but she did not participate. Her lawyer did, of course, right? Okay. Right. But she did not, right? She now, you, then you say the, the judge did that in September of 2012 without any hearing. We talked about the hearing versus telephone conference, so I don't need to go back into that without any process. Mm -hmm. When you say without any process, are you referring to the fact that Ms. Grazini Rucky was not at the hearing and didn't receive any process? Is that what you're referring to? I, I'm, referring, 
I'm sorry. That objection leading. Oh, overruled. Yes. Obviously, Sandra wasn't involved in that process, the process. And then you say in two hours, the court quote unquote ordered her, she was already divorced, to leave her home. Right. And that was in fact what happened when that order was was signed by the judge, she was asked to leave her house immediately. Is that correct? Right. It was worse than that because she was asked to leave her home. The, the order was dated the same day. So I, I'm thinking it was September 6th or 12th, something like that. So I want to get the date of the order right. So well, in any just... event, she was ordered to, in, the order was dated the same day. It said, you must leave your home by noon today. Leave your children there. You can't bring any of your property, and and you'll you can't contact your children even through third third parties, and you cannot come back to your home. And that is the status to today. So when you say that she was denied process, what are you referring to? Due process, I see that as a civil rights violation. If you're living in a home for 14 years with your five kids, raising them, and then you uh, get a, uh, an order that says you, that's dated that same day that says by noon that day, you have to leave and you can't have any contact with your children and it's a family court order. It's not an order for protection. It's not a harassment restraining order. And the order even said, have somebody come move into your own home to take care of your children, some somebody else besides the parents, and both parents were subject to it. Both parents, not just Sandra. So was it that process that you described what you were criticizing? Okay. Right. Okay. Did the you process, feel, did, yes. Did you feel as a candidate for public office that you could raise a criticism of a process like what happened here? Did you feel yes. that you had a right to say something about that? Yes, uh, absolutely. I was asked about it. I'm, I'm not going to say it was okay. I'm not going to say that it was okay for, uh, I, I'm going to say that it was a civil rights violation because I, I think if, if anybody would recognize that. Well, in, in your view of family court after practicing for 33 years, what is due process as to notice of a hearing and whether the hearing is public? And what are the components of a, of a fair hearing, in your opinion, in your studied view of the law after 33 years? Well, at, at the time, you'd schedule a hearing. You for, First of all, you'd have to, the, this is between attorneys now, the attorney would have to write a letter to the other attorney explaining the problem. Uh, and if you, if the other attorney decided not to assist or then you would schedule a hearing, you'd have to make sure the attorney is available for the hearing, first of all, before you schedule it. Uh, and then you would prepare pleadings, it would have to be a notice of motion and motion, an affidavit, and a memorandum, and you would file those. Uh, the opposing counsel would have an opportunity to bring uh, more issues. He'd have to respond within 10 days, and he'd also have an a, 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 a opportunity to respond five days before the hearing, and then the judge has all the information in front of the judge. The judge holds a hearing, and then sometimes when the judge holds a hearing, they get 90 days to make a decision. So that is the process that I uh, certainly was used to. Even now, uh, they've changed the rules in family law, where now you have to give uh, uh, three weeks um, um, notice, not two weeks anymore. So they've extended it for more notice. Then later in your statement, you were asked about uh, page 71. And you mentioned uh, that a deprivation occurred by this process that we've just talked about. Mm -hmm. Right. And are you referring to a deprivation of civil rights? Is that what you're referring to? Yes, the deprivation of 
uh, 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 rights. It's, it's, it's very serious if you're ordered to stay away from your home that you own. She owned the home, by the way. It was in only her name. She was court, and you're, she had lived there for 14 years, raising her five kids for 14 years that she had custody of. And in a phone call, yes, I think anybody would see that as a deprivation of, of rights, of liberty rights with your children and your property. So when you were mentioning this deprivation of rights, and it is a criminal statute, were you giving your opinion as a candidate for office? Uh, in a sense, what was incorrect or what was deficient about the court system? Yes, but you said something about criminal. Well, and deprivation of criminal uh, civil rights can be a crime too, can it not? Deprivation of civil rights is not a crime. It could be criminal, yes. This was this was civil. But you were giving your opinion as to a concern as to how this case was handled, were you not? I was giving my opinion. And were you when you were on this radio interview, did it ever cross your mind that you were attempting to violate any terms of your probation? Not not at all. I was uh, just uh, giving my honest opinion about the, the situation. And it, uh, I did not believe that I was, I violated uh, anything. All right, did you, were you aware um, <clears throat> that, uh, were you aware that any complaint had been filed by Judge Knudsen with the board concerning the CCO interview? No. Nope. Have you had uh, conversations with him at various ends of court meetings um, where he has expressed any concern whatsoever about this interview? Uh, I've had, com I had conversations with him after the last election. And uh, there was a, ro uh, do you want me to describe? And we've, we've, we've met, I consider our relationship, uh, I guess, restored to a, to a sense, to a, uh, I, but we met um, right after the election. So I don't uh, know that he uh, complained. No, I, I, I would happen to be at a, a uh, rotary function. It was a big function. There were about 200 people there. And I saw him and he had won the election and I had done well, but I had not won the election. And uh, he can't, he approached me. And I even said to him, you know, oh, you're approaching me. Like, you know, I, he's like, oh, no, you know, it's, it's just business as usual. And uh, we had somebody there. Her name was Lori, who actually, uh, we, we talked, we had a pleasant conversation, but what we did was we actually prayed. Uh, we uh, huddled and Lori prayed for us to move on from all of this. And that, and, and, and we have, we've seen each other at in of court. He's in a different in of court, but at least twice since then I've seen him there. We've moved on, but we actually said a prayer together. It was a, uh, it was, uh, it was unbelievable for me because it was another one of those miracles where you uh, go, wow, you know, just a chance meeting and you end up having somebody there to actually to pray with, with you in a circle to kind of everybody to move on. So uh, we have moved on. <laughs> and again, I've, I've even sat beside him at different events. I'm not, uh, I've moved on. And he has too. Let me ask you uh, finally about uh, this Rod Corp complaint that you filed. Um, you know, you were never you were never charged or a suspect in the Grazini Rucky child abduction. Is that right? That's true. Okay. For a time, you represented Sandra Grazini Rucky, correct? Yes, I represented but, but, Sandra. Uh, the record is that once she got charged, she went to a different lawyer named Stephen Grigsby. Is that fair? Uh, I'm thinking. 
looking that she got arrested and I represent, she was in Florida and got arrested and I was in touch with the county attorney uh, the entire time as she was being moved from Florida to, to Minnesota. And then I, I, I had all she had. <laughs> so I, there was a, a bail hearing and actually uh, Judge Knutson was listed as, a, as judge to do her bail hearing. So um, I got to the bail hearing and it had already been, been determined by the time I got there. Object to the relevance of... Let me, let me, let me uh, focus you in here. Eventually, Stephen Grigsby represented her at trial, right? Right, right. Okay. But uh, I was still representing her in her family court matter. Right, okay. So with, with Mr. Broadcorp, when he talks about our relationship getting different, it was because now he starts asking me questions about a case. Before it was about my run for office. So to suddenly he, I'm an attorney for somebody and he's asking me questions about a case. That's why I couldn't talk to him. I, I don't understand, you know, if I, I, I'd be uh, uh, revealing attorney client privileges. And I think the attorney client privilege is the last privilege left aside from maybe talking to a priest. Uh, Ms. So, McDonald, excuse me, excuse me. Um, once again, if you could listen to the question and answer the question asked, I think we'll move along a little quicker. Okay, Ms. McDonald, let me uh, focus in on this person of interest phrase that we've heard about. Uh, what was your objection to Mr. Broadcorp? Um, printing and reprinting that phrase on his website and repeating it for the public. Oh, he, it, it wasn't, to, in my mind, it wasn't true be, because it had been reported by another reporter. I, uh, Broadcorp kind of took what that other reporter said. This is, my point of view. It's reported by the other reporter. I contact that other reporter. He never reports it again. Brandon Stahl never reported that again. Okay, why and did, then, let me ask you this though. Why, why, does, why did that hurt your reputation or why did you feel that that was defamatory and then turn, why did you sue on that basis? Oh, it was very defamatory. And, you gotta and, tell us how it was for you. I can't, I can't lead you through this. You gotta tell, tell us where, I, why it's defamatory. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm representing Sandra, first of all. So now, you know, he's going around saying I'm a person of interest. And then he's saying things like I'm not cooperating with the police, uh, things like that. Uh, when I, in, in, in my view, I was, I was representing a client. So it was a, a distraction. And it also wasn't true to my knowledge, to my knowledge, because the, the police department never contacted me. So how could I be a person of interest if they never called me up? They never wrote me a letter. They never asked me for any information. So uh, I, I, if also, ultimately, and it was a, probably a couple years later because even as the case evolved, he kept, he still today says, I'm a person of interest. This case has been over for years now. So I, I'll try to answer your question, but ultimately as the case evolved, I did decide to contact the police because I kept telling him to stop um, uh, saying it. And he said, well, I can't stop talking about a label that I didn't put there. So he, uh, he was acting as if the police gave me that label. They didn't, they don't use that label. Right? Did you? The, let me ask I you contacted that. the police. They said, no, just wait no. a second. Ms. McDonald, let me ask you the question, though. So you contacted, I think you talked about this on direct. I want to get into your letters here for a second, though. You contacted the police and they did, 
we had a discussion earlier about this person of interest and they denied using that phrase. Let me ask you the next question, which is, did you attempt to uh, write letters either through you or your counsel to, to tell him that he should cease and desist from using that person of interest uh, phrase against you in his, his blog and whatever else he was writing? Right. I, I, I did. In, 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 but here's what ended up happening. All of a sudden, okay, out of the blue, on his blogs, his Twitter, uh, everything, he takes that picture and says, I'm a person of interest. Now, it's one thing to say you're a person of interest, right? Because some reporter said you are, and, and, and I wasn't, because police do not use those terms. That's what they told me. They use so what was it? What was it about the picture and the phrase that, that you found to be so offensive? So he would take the picture and as, uh, uh, so uh, Sandra got charged, Dee Dee Evavold got charged, the couple that owned the farm uh, that uh, brings in um, children who are abused got charged and he'd have, they were actually charged and he'd have their pictures up, uh, their mug shots, if you will, up with my picture. Uh, as if I, and then he'd say person of interest. So uh, he was defaming me by somebody just glancing at it would say, oh, where'd that picture come? She must have been charged. Or was she charged and then it got dropped? So he started to use that picture. He never identified when the picture was taken. He never identified uh, uh, what, where he got the picture. He told me where he got it because once that picture came up, and this is again two years after the picture was taken, okay. it starts coming up on his his blog. And I wrote him and I said, "Please take that picture down." Before yeah, let me stop I, you. I, then. Let me stop you. I, we have uh, offered McDonald's Exhibit One, which includes uh, several of these letters that you wrote. Uh, or, or your lawyer wrote to him. Am I right about that? Making this very same complaint right. that you described. Fair right. enough? Right. Okay. In response to those letters, did he take down this person of interest phrase, or did he take down as well that picture that you found uh, offensive associated with the phrase? Did he make any changes as he, in response to your concerns that were expressed in these letters before the suit was filed? No, he ramped them up. He put the picture on once. And when I asked him to take it down, he ramped it up. It was all over his blogs, all over his Twitter, all over his Facebook. This picture from three years before that didn't have any relevance in, 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 the, in, the, in the, ca the case, uh, the, the, the prosecution of, of, of the case. Uh, so he started to focus and, and be obsessed with this case, and he started to, uh, uh, like, trash me. I mean, I could do, do nothing right. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, I'm not co cooperating with police. He says that. I'm an attorney. The police haven't called me. How can I cooperate with police if they never call me? Things like that. So he need and that's called defamation by implication. Okay, let me stop then, you there. Let me stop you there, Ms. McDonald. Um, you know, <clears throat> you eventually decided, am I right, that after he did respond to your letters and ramped up his blog that, that you decided to file suit. Am I right about that? Okay. Well, again, I could go through the numerous letters. I think the, the court has a few of them. Uh, a couple I... The first was a, 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 an email I wrote to him, and then a, a couple of letters from me uh, on behalf of my law firm to his attorneys. So I wrote to him directly, and then I started, uh, he told me, at, at, he said, contact my attorney. Um, so I told him to stop, cease and desist. He said, contact my attorney. He told me his attorney was Gregory Walsh. So I wrote a letter on August 3rd to Gregory Walsh, I wrote a letter on August 18th to Gregory Walsh. I wrote a letter on, on uh, I emailed um, Mr. Hansen because 
uh, I actually personally served one of these letters on, uh, on, on, on Mr. Hansen because then Mr. Hansen became his attorney. And then uh, Mr. Walsh wrote me back, said I'm not representing him. And so I would be, I, I wasn't, he, he was very coy in, in who was representing him. And ultimately Nathan Hansen uh, started representing him. And that's when I hired an attorney. I hired an attorney to, to write a letter on March 17th, 2017. Uh, and and that, please, 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 let me stop you for a second. I mean, Michelle. Excuse, uh, me, excuse me, counsel and everybody. <laughs> the question you were asked was, then did you file a lawsuit? Mm -hmm. And then you started on another long uh, narrative that uh, we we've probably been through already. Well, actually, maybe we haven't, but I've, I've certainly looked at the exhibit. Um, and so once again, if you could, we're actually getting to the point where supposedly our window for Zoom has expired, but I'm assuming, Ms. Nelson, that you can keep us going. It was supposed to be uh, to expire at four o'clock. Right. Well, uh, in, any, in, in any event, um, Ms. McDonald, once again, if you could listen carefully to your uh, the question you're asked and just to answer that question, I think we'll be able to get through this more quickly. Thank you. Okay, Ms. McDonald, <clears throat> thank you, Your Honor. And Ms. McDonald, we have submitted the letters as an exhibit, but what they show in summary, uh, I mean, we could spend a half hour on each, each uh, communication. What they, they show is a persistent effort by you to address what you thought was defamatory by Mr. Broadcourt. Would that be fair? Okay. Yes, and okay. then I filed a lawsuit. All right, so well, again, now I want to get to the lawsuit. Okay, let me lead you through your lawsuit here. Um, uh, you, you raised a number of claims in your lawsuit. The, the first is this person of interest matter, and you've explained to us uh, why you raised that. Have you not? Yes, and, okay. it, and it is explained in the lawsuit. All right, and so the... The, the lawsuit contained two counts. One was straight defamation and one was straight defamation by implication. Is that right? Right. And there was a question in Minnesota law as to the application of defamation by implication to someone who doesn't hold office, as I understand it. Is that right? Right. So okay. and, and let me continue this. In your, in your research of the law, you felt that there was... Um, a good faith claim to defamation by implication to someone who does not hold public office, and that's why you pled it. Am I right about that? Absolutely. Okay, and you did that on the basis of your research, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you did it in good faith. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. And if I if I can summarize the claim, is that uh, you felt that. By implication, he was associating you with criminal conduct uh, when you'd never been charged and never been interviewed. Is Judge, I renew my fair? objection to this leading series of questions. I'm trying to uh, move this along just a little bit, that's all. Yes, I, I, I understand your concern, um, but once again, I think it will help, especially because uh, Mr. Eng is referred, referring to a document um, that is in evidence, and uh, I will let him uh, do a little bit of leading to move it along. But uh, thank you for your objection. So that was the that was the theory. He was associating you with criminal behavior as a lawyer, and in turn, besmirching your reputation. I'm summarizing for you, I know, but um, that was the gist of one part of your complaint. Am I right about that? Right. Okay. Defamation. Now, so defamation by implication, it, it's different. It may involve truthful statements that imply defamatory conduct. And it occurs when either uh, a defendant either juxtaposes a series of facts to imply a defamatory connection to them or creates a defamatory implication by omitting facts. And that's precisely what um, Mr. Broadcorp was doing. Uh, it's a false implication. It's a falsity by implication. And something might be technically true, uh, but the, the, his website as a whole created a false impression 
of ongoing criminal activity, ongoing criminal investigation uh, of me. And to me, that was both defamatory and defamatory by implication. And that's why you sued him in part, right? That is why I sued him, yes. And this photograph is mentioned in the, um, in the complaint. He, and you talked about where you, where you, where he told you you got the complaint, the photograph off that website and so forth. But <clears throat> is it, is it your view that by placing a photograph uh, taken from jail that he was implying or implicating you in criminal behavior in connection with this Brzezini Rucky abduction of these two kids? Was that your sense of what he was trying to do to you? Right. Yes. Now, this, you also accused him of misleading the public on the, the question of whether you had been convicted of a DWI. Am I right about that? Yes, he was, okay. he, there was defamation by implication there as well. And the, the, um, he mentioned on direct that he'd never Twittered anything about you being convicted of a DWI during the break. Over lunch hour, did you uh, find his Twitter account and his Twitter that indicated that you had a DWI conviction when you didn't? Did you find that for me? I, I did, yes. Okay. Let me read it to what he says and then we will ask the okay, court to submit Josh, it. I, I have no idea what counsel is referring to. I don't have a document in front of me. This is not appropriate. But we just found it over lunch after you lied about it. Yes. And I, I still have a right to see what you're reading to your client. Right. Well, it, and I would say that if we were in a courtroom and uh, Mr. Eng could hand a copy to me and could hand a copy to you, um, that would be ideal. But since, um, mm -hmm. since we're not and he can't, um, I'm going to allow him to examine from uh, a uh, uh, a document that he has found and you will have access to it. And uh, um, I don't know if maybe it can be emailed as an attachment so uh, she can see it uh, in preparation for her following, following examination. But uh, there was certainly testimony uh, from Mr. Broadcorp that he had not, or he did not believe, I think, that he had, uh, had tweeted um, anything about this, and I think this this uh, is an appropriate uh, response to that testimony of Mr. Broadcorp. So, Mr. Eng, you can proceed, and if we, if there's any way you can share this with us, that's fine. I'm not sure that you can, but it would be ideal if you could. Well, I, um, I'm techno, I'm <laughs> technologically naive. I can read it to you. We'll We'll submit it. If she has a complaint about it, we can deal can, with it. Can I make a suggestion? He can get it in through me. It's, it was he, he tweeted it on my phone. Well, let me read it to you, and then we'll deal with it. Uh, we'll admit it later. Um, does he say to you, does he say on his Twitter account, Ms. McDonald, quotes, um, the DWI conviction of former state Supreme Court candidate Michelle McDonald was upheld Tuesday by Court of Appeals. Is that what it says? Yes. Okay, and you objected and, to that. Yes, I texted him back and I said, I did not get convicted of a DUI. Please get the facts straight and retract this material omissions will not be tolerated. And I, that and was on February 16, 2016. And that is right in my complaint. I just didn't attach the uh, Twitter. And did he retract that? No. I didn't see that he retracted it at all. So you've got your uh, complaint ready. It's an exhibit. You file it. Um, it, it is venued in Ramsey County, correct? And what, right. happens, what happens next is he never files an answer, but instead files uh, a motion for sanctions. Is that right? Right. Okay. And then he never filed, he never filed, Your Honor, an answer to the complaint. Never filed a general denial or e even uh, addressed it. So all of these allegations are deemed true. So what happened next, if I may lead you, and then we'll get to the, some unleading question, is that the, your lawyer um, filed a motion for default, then he filed a motion for summary judgment. 
Is that kind of the sequence here? Right. And you hired um, a lawyer, Carloba Powell, to represent you. Right. Right. She reviewed the file and pleadings and signed it. Is that correct? Right. And she endorsed it as her own work. Is that right? And then what occurred is that you had a summary judgment hearing before Judge Kyle. Is that right? Right. Okay. It was a combined was default judgment and summary judgment. It was a combined hearing. We had done a, a default judgment because he hadn't answered. And he uh, uh, retorted with a summary judgment hearing. And, and also, he had already brought Rule 11 sanctions that had been denied, dismissed, withdrawn. So uh, uh, his initial reaction of filing those Rule 11 sections, I think he did that within days through his attorney, and filing the board complaint the same day, he basically two days after he gets this complaint, and then never answering it throughout the whole, whole time. All right. Let uh, me ask you a couple more questions. So eventually what occurs here is that the matter is litigated on summary judgment. And you took the position that you were not a public figure. You mm -hmm. had lost a couple of elections. And that was a legal question mm -hmm. for Judge Kyle to decide. Oh, it was. Yes. Okay. I wasn't. I, my position was, yes, I had run for office, but I had never been uh, elected. So, I, yeah. So, so, uh, Yes, I, I, I can't. You can sue for defamation and by implication, but now you can't <laughs> because uh, new law was created. And you, if you're a public figure or uh, an elected government official, you cannot sue for defamation by implication. Period. That's okay. what the case said. Up, up until the time your case was decided, though, that was an open question in your research of the law. Am I right about? Oh, yeah. The Dietzen case left it an open question. That's a 30-year-old case, and there were uh, dissents, and uh, it wasn't even a, um, I think it was a Supreme Court case, but so that was a very much an open question, yes. And that's one of the major issues that Judge Ross wrote about in his opinion mm -hmm. for the Court of Appeals, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Judge, Judge Ross didn't, didn't find... Uh, didn't uh, dismiss the case because he didn't uh, lie about me or because my complaint was untrue. He dismissed the case because of the legal issues. The legal issues being that I'm a public figure and I can't sue for defamation by implication. That, um, that's why it was dismissed. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Once again, Ms. McDonald, I've actually read the entire file. I've read all of the cases. I understand the holdings. And I'm an attorney as well as a judge. And I do understand the legal issues. So you don't need to explain them to me or to Mr. Eng. And once again, if you could just uh, stay within the bounds of the question. <laughs> Thank I you. I appreciate that, Your Honor. I, I, didn't, I kn knew you had the exhibits, but I didn't think you had read them. OK. Uh, Ms. McDonald, uh, was there an application in the Ramsey County District Court for uh, fees uh, made by Mr. Broadcourt, if you remember? He, f he filed right off the bat Rule 11 sanctions uh, with his, oh. through his attorney. Okay. Did he get sanctions from Judge Kyle? No, he didn't. And he didn't get them in Dakota County either. He filed in both counties. Did he get sanctions after the Court of Appeals decision? He didn't even ask for them. Okay. Uh, a couple more questions. That photograph that we've talked about, um, you indicated it wasn't a booking photograph. Was there a court order that you were not to be booked as, in response to that arrest during the trial, if you recall? Yes. And are you willing to supplement the record to offer that court, court order to Judge McKinsey after we close the hearing today? Yes. Okay. No and also, the, that case was dismissed, and I believe I gave you the dismissal order as well. Okay, we will supply those with leave of the court. We'll supply those as well. 
I have no further questions of Ms. McDonald. Thank you very much, Your Honor. All right, uh, Ms. Ratnayake, if you um, have further questions based on just this testimony that aren't repetitive of your earlier uh, examination, uh, then please proceed. Judge, I do, um, but can we address the issue first of how I can see a copy of what Mr. Eng was referencing with Ms. McDonald regarding the tweet? Um, is there any way one of you, Mr. Eng or Ms. McDonald, can uh, uh, just uh, email uh, this as an attachment to an email address that... Uh, um, I, I can do that. I'll do that right now. Okay. I just sent it. Okay. Did you send it to me too or... No, I didn't. I'll send, I'm sorry. I'll send it to you too. <laughs> so it should show up in my, uh, in, in my, um, in my court uh, email file. I imagine. Let's see. Oh, here you are. What's the say? Okay. I sent it to you too. Okay, I'm not seeing it yet. It's AOL, but... so it may take a while. Judge, would it be possible to take maybe a 10 minute recess while we're waiting for this email to um, arrive to us and so that I may have a little bit of time to review it, um, not on camera like this, please? Uh, well, let's, let's talk about timing again. Um, uh, how much, yeah, we can. How much uh, time do you think you're going to need uh, to finish your examination? <clears throat> um, I maybe 15 minutes or so, and then I I also need to just after reviewing what Mr. Eng sent, need to just a few minutes to think about whether we'd want to recall Mr. Broadcourt. Uh, okay, um, Mr. Eng, uh, are, you aren't going to have anything more, is that correct? No, I finished my uh, redirect. Okay, and... Uh, I, I don't think, whatever she asked, I don't think it would be very lengthy on my part. I've said my piece, so... Okay, and you aren't planning on calling any other witnesses or pre presenting any other uh, uh, exhibits, is that correct? Uh, not at this time. I would leave to file this uh, tweet um, in the order saying she didn't have to be booked. Other than that, no. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, let's take, uh, can we take 10 minutes then? And I still don't, uh, oh, oh, yes. Okay. I now see that it has arrived in my, in my court email. So, uh, so council, maybe you can take a look at it and we'll, we'll go off the record um, uh, and uh, you can uh, turn off your video, and when you are ready, come on back, and we'll watch for you. Okay. Okay, thank you.
Mr. Eng, did you get my email I sent? No, I didn't look yet. Okay, I, I didn't get the document. Well. So there's no PDF in, in the email at all? It, it, it opens up and it's a blank it's a blank document that says um, notepad document and has nothing in it. So that's why I suggested you, <laughs> you try my, e, uh, my Gmail address again, if you can, which I have open, I'm, I'm waiting. <laughs> okay, where, where is your, where is your, what is your address in Gmail? Um, E-A-M-C-K-I-N-S-E-Y at Gmail. Uh, maybe you ought to go slower. E A. And then my last. C my last name. Okay. At Gmail. E A M C K I N S E Y. Yes. I just sent it. Sorry about this. I wasn't looking at my emails. I only have one screen up at a time, fearing that I'd lose everything. So. Yeah, I know. I've been trying to manage multiple screens also. Yeah, I don't know how you do it, actually. <laughs> Not well. Yeah. It's still spinning around. It'll go. It's still spinning. I'm not sure why, but it's spinning. <laughs> okay, it should have gone through. Ah, okay. Let's see if I can open it. Okay, all I have, oh, there we go. It's four pages long. Yeah, there should be a oh, screenshot okay. of a cell phone is what it is. Right. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay, great. but I don't see a Twitter. This is, it may have been, a, it's, you just see the at Michael M. Broadcorp, RT, you see yes. that? Okay. Yes, but it appears to be. Oh, I see. Whether it's a text or a Twitter, it, it is what it is. We can dispute as to the title of it, but not the text, so. Okay, I, I guess I don't know what it is, but uh, you can explain it later and I'm gonna stop talking okay. um, ex, ex party here. <laughs> okay.
Judge, I, I am ready to proceed if you're um, ready as well. I, can you hear me? No? Yes. Okay. I, I reduced, I reduced the, the panel so I could look at two other panels and now I can't get the, get it back again. Just give me a minute here. Well, I only, I only have a Ms. Ratnayaka and nobody else in a tiny picture. So I don't know what to do about that. Oh, you are, I think I, if you I, click on it, you'll get all of us. I, did. I had that happen. I did. I got everybody back. Okay. Okay. Are, are we ready then? Yes. Uh, go ahead. Okay, and I, I'm sorry. I did Mr. Mr. Eng conclude his direct examination of Ms. McDonald? Yes. Okay. Um, Judge, we would like to recall Mr. Broadcorp just to briefly clear up the issue um, of the the tweet that uh, the tweet exchange between Mr. Eng and Ms. McDonald. No. I'd like to testify first as to it, since I have an opportunity here. Why don't we finish her examination and then we can go to Mr. Broadcorp if that's okay. Okay, I, I'm sorry, that's what I was asking. I, I, I thought that they had finished, but. No, I, yes, it's, it's, it's your turn to examine Ms. McDonald. So why don't we finish with her and then you can call Mr. Broadcorp if you need to. Okay. So, Ms. McDonald, you you spent some time talking us through the pot bin, um, ish, pot bin case um, again with Mr. Eng, and I just want to be clear something up with you. You had stated during your testimony that um, Ms. Adams Powell was not part of your firm but was an independent contractor, correct? I have an employment agreement with her and, and several other attorneys. Okay, but your employment agreement with her is that she is an independent contractor that you use for various services. That's the type, yeah. And, but she is not a member of the McDonald Law Firm. No, she is not. Okay. <clears throat> That's why she's listed with a separate address and okay. phone number. Okay, thank you. Um, you and Mr. Eng also went through, again, your, your, your opinions about Ms. Grazini, um, Grazini Ruzik's phone conference that occurred in September um, and your opinion that it was done without due process. Uh, but you, you, in your previous referee hearing, admitted that you, did ne you never spoke to Ms. Grazini Ruzik's attorney at the time, Lisa Henry, um, to discuss what conversations occurred between her and her client at the time that this hearing phone conference was occurring. Objection they asked the answer already. Uh, I'll allow it. I, I got, so that was in September. I got the case in um, January uh, and 
my I, I went down to the courthouse and looked at all the files. I spent several hours down there before I even took the case because there was a lot of files. I went down Wait, to the courthouse Ms. and looked at every file. Ms. McDonald, I'm I'm only asking you whether it's correct that you didn't in your preparations speak to Lisa Elliott, or, I'm sorry, Lisa Henry, your client's former attorney, about her conversations with her client during the time of this phone conference and the order? I may have, there was so much to it. I, I wasn't just, I was taking over the case, not, not just that order. So I may have talked to her about the entire case. Okay, but when you testified at your last hearing and were asked about this, you testified at the time that you did not have a recollection or knowledge of conversations that may have occurred between Ms. Grazini Ruzik and her attorney regarding this order and the phone conference. Wait, that's that's a different question. I don't, that's a different question. Okay, Ms. McDonald, I understand that you're saying that you reviewed the file when you got the case. I'm specifically asking whether you interviewed or talked to Miss Henry regarding what her conversations were with her client surrounding this phone conference and her participation and the order that was issued. I don't recall. Probably I did because I, I would have found it very egregious, but I it was a, it was, there was a lot of things I looked at. I, I wasn't focused when I, when I first got the case on that order. So like I'm, I told you earlier that I, I'm not, I, I don't have a recollection of a specific conversations about that particular order. Okay. So your answer about, is that you, you do not remember talking to Miss Henry about what her conversations were with her client regarding this order and the phone conference. Um, I talked with Sandra about the conversation. I, I understand. She didn't know about it. So uh, I don't it's know if Ms. Henry can help, help me. Yeah, there was an objection. This is improper impeachment. If she has a transcript, the proper impeachment is, did you say this on this day? And was this your, is this the question? Is this your answer? That's the oh. fair way to do this. I object improper impeachment. And Your Honor, at this point, I'm having difficulty actually understanding what Ms. McDonald's answer to the question is. Yes, uh, because you're wanting a yes, and I don't know. Okay, I don't recall. Good. All right, that's that's good. That's a good answer. Uh, move on. Next question. Ms. McDonald, you testified about your understanding of how family court hearings happen and the procedures that normally occur. You're aware that this phone conference that occurred prior to the order being issued was an emergency conference, right? Yeah, and emergency conferences don't happen that way either. Okay, yeah. but you, so, you no, there is there is a procedure for emergency orders as well. It does not happen where everybody just gets on a phone call. It does not happen. It happened okay, in this case. You you agree that it was in fact an emergency. It was characterized as an emergency conference. The, uh, the, the order that Judge Knutson signed says emer emergency conference or emergency telephone conference. So I don't characterize it as anything. You do not, I repeat, do not. I can't call a judge okay, McDonald, or another attorney and just start chit-chatting. Ms. McDonald, I'm not asking for your opinion on whether you think it was appropriate that it was characterized as an emergency conference. I'm asking whether you understand that that's how it was characterized by the parties at the time. It was, it says, I don't know how it was characterized by the parties at the time. It says emergency telephone conference on the order. <coughs> okay. Ms. McDonald, do you understand that there is a difference between legal defamation and being offended by someone using a photo that you find unflattering? Of course. Okay, in, but in your complaints regarding that photo, you've many times referenced that you're, you find it offensive rather than defamatory. 
I, the, again, the complaint speaks for itself. It's very extensive. That complaint doesn't involve just these three things. There were other things that he did. Okay. Um, Ms. McDonald, you testified that your attorney, Ms. Adams Powell, um, signed off on the complaint on your, on your defamation complaint, correct? Right. And as your attorney, Ms. Adams Powell was relying on your representation of the facts to her, correct? Of course she was, yes. Okay. And you, you acknowledge that you are actually the person who drafted all of the language that was stated in that complaint? Of course, and it was all true. And Mr. Broadcorp never objected to anything except these three things that we're talking about today. He never filed a general denial he never filed an answer. So we're talking about three things that he objected to. Correct, but he, as we know, prevailed on a summary judgment motion. Of course, yes, he did. We all know that. Okay, Judge, we'd have no further questions for Ms. McDonald. Um, at this time, we would um, seek the court's permission to recall Mr. Broadcorb to briefly clear up um, the issue of this tweet. I have right. a redirect, if I could. One question, two couple of questions, yes. Your Honor. Go ahead. Ms. McDonald, uh, we were talking uh, about this um, message from Mr. Broadcorp that I read to you before. Are you, do you know whether it's a, a tweet or uh, a text or what you would call it? I mean, did that matter to you just, or what mattered to you was the content of what he was saying? Right, in, in a certain paragraph in my complaint, I believe it was paragraph 58, I want to I ask said, you about, let me ask you about that then. In paragraph 58 of your complaint, which is exhibit 12, do you say that on February 16th, 2016, Broadcourse falsely reported in a tweet that Ms. McDonald had a DWI, DUI conviction? Is that correct? Right. And that's what, you re, in your complaint, you're referring to this tweet or text that we talked about before uh, the recross examination. Is that right? Yes. That's where you got the data to put in that paragraph. Fair enough? Right. Okay. Yeah, and, and this is this is a snapshot of my phone. So this is Mr. Broadcorp calling me, contacting me, and he this is his, him contacting me. And then I contacted him back. I said, I did not get convicted of a, of a DUI. Please get the facts straight and retract this material omission will not be tolerated. Then this is Mr. Broadcare contacting me again on 329.16. So, so this is what I was referring to in my complaint. I wasn't referring to that other post that he mentions in some of his pleadings. Thank you very much. No further questions. Uh, anything further, uh, counsel, Ms. Batnayaka? Uh, so Ms. Ms. McDonald, what you're stating is that your complaint stated that Mr. Broadcorp, Mr. Broadcorp falsely reported in a tweet that you had a DWI conviction. I put that in my complaint. I said on February 16, 2016, Broadcorp falsely reported in a tweet that Ms. McDonald had a DUI conviction. Yes, and this was what I was referring to. He brought something else forward. Okay, um, Mr. Ang, are you are you done with your questions as well? I have no further questions. Thank you very much. All right, um, then, Mr. Ang, um, are you uh, then uh, <laughs> are you through with your case? Is <laughs> I, yes, and we're resting, Your Honor. Save, save and accept. I would like to submit that tweet or text as an exhibit, and then we'd like to submit an exhibit that explains that she was never booked on that photograph, which is a court order. Other than that, we're resting your honor. All right, that was the word I was looking for, was resting. <laughs> so, all right. Um, then uh, uh, Ms. Ratnakia, Ratnayaka, Ratnayaka, there. <laughs> uh, any, uh, anything further from, uh, from the, uh, the board. Um, Judge, the, the director would like to the brief director, you. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, what did you say? I just said yes, the director. Right. Okay, um, the director would like to briefly recall Mr. Brad Corb to clear up um, this tweet issue. And is he available? 
Yep. Um, Linda, could you, is Mr. Broadcorb in the waiting room? He's not in the waiting room, no. Okay, let me just tell him to jump back in. Tell Paul to ask him. Tell Paul to ask him if he has washed him. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Paul, be sure to ask him if he has washed Michelle, him. we can hear you. So. Linda, can you um, add Mr. Broadcorb? He says he's getting a message that he can't join because he was removed by the host. I will resend the link to him. Okay. Actually, what I'll do is I'll add him. Yeah, I'll, I'll resend it in a way that I think he should be able to get back in. Okay. Ms. McDonald, could you mute, please? Okay, Shani, I just resent the link. Hopefully this will work. Um, okay. Let me know if it doesn't. Okay. And I have, in effect, I re-invited him. Okay.
Um, Keshni, he's still telling me he can't get in. The only solution I know of is to end this meeting, schedule another one and send that link and, link and everybody would have to re-link in. He's still saying he can't get in. Okay. Linda, do you know how long that would take to resend, to end the meeting and resend the link? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Oh wait, he's just entered the waiting room. Okay, perfect. Woo. All right, here we go. Mr. Broadcorp, can you hear us? Apparently not. Mr. Broadcorp, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Um, you're on mute, Mr. Bradcord. Mr. Bradcorp separately uh, emailed me and said he was in. I've, I've, I've responded to him and let him know that he needs to activate his audio and video. Okay, yeah, I, I, he was clearly trying to, um, so I'm not sure. And we did see him briefly, um, but so I, I'm not sure what's happening. Can you hear me? Can you, can you hear us? Yes, I apologize. I had a, it, I, the link wouldn't work for my phone, so that my computer decided to use my cell phone. Okay, well, you're sideways, but we don't care. Uh, there okay. you go. Okay. There we go. All right, so I need to remind you first that you were um, placed under oath earlier, and so you are still under oath. Um, uh, Council, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bradcourt, I'm going to do a screen share screen um, and show you a an image that Ms. McDonald has produced, um, and I'd like you to to take a look at it. Um, so if you could, I'll just bear with me for a moment. Um, all right, let me. I'm gonna. No, oh, that's not it. Um, let 
I'm sorry. For some reason, my computer is whited out in a way that I'm having just a little bit of trouble seeing. So I'm going to try and close out some of these other things so I can see a little bit better. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. No worries. Okay, um, can everybody, is everybody able to see this image? Yes. Judge, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Um, so Mr. Broadcorb, can you please explain to the court um, what this screenshot image is? And just let me know if you need me to scroll it up or down. No, I can see it. It's a it's a tweet from well, it's a, it's the tweet from David Channon with the Star Tribune who tweeted that Mc, Michelle had been EWI conviction of former Supreme Court candidate Michelle McDonald was upheld Tuesday. That's not my tweet. Okay, so first, if I, I'll just back you up a little bit. So at the top here, I don't know if you can kind of see with my mo with my mouse. I can see it, yes. Okay, so at the top, it, it says reporter Mike BR. Can you, do you yep. know what that means? Like, why is that written here on her, on this phone? She might have sent me, I don't know what it is. It, it could be, it looks, I, I, it appears that she has an, she looks like she's using an Android phone. Um, I don't know. Uh, it may have been a uh, text exchange or something. I don't know. Okay, is is this screenshot um, from Twitter? No, it's not a tweet from me, and it's not from Twitter. Okay, and there's a there's a date here in the middle two sixteen sixteen six o two p.m. Um, are these messages? that are being exchanged between you and Miss and the Miss McDonald or whoever's phone this is. I I I don't know. I don't have any record of that text exchange with Miss McDonald, nor as I've testified under oath and in a sworn affidavit, did I ever send that tweet out. It's a tweet from David Channon with the Star Tribune. Okay, and how can you explain how you know that the message here in the middle, the DWI court, the DWI conviction of former state Supreme Court candidate. Um, how do you know that that is a tweet from this person you've identified? Well, first of all, um, I, I know that Twitter account. Um, after I received this, after this was submitted, this tweet was not submitted in the record in the district court matter. Um, and when it was submitted in the Court of Appeals, I went out on Twitter and found that tweet. That tweet still exists today by David, David Channon. Uh, I've never retweeted it. Um, that tweet still exists. So that was a tweet he sent out on uh, February 16th, 2016. It's not a tweet by me. It's a tweet from David Channon. If Ms. McDonald has concerns about it, she should take it up with Mr. Channon. So can you, what... How are you able to identify that this is from David Channing? Because that's the, that's because it's, it looks like it's an at, it's, it's, first of all, that's the Twitter handle of at David Channing, who's Channing Strib. And then it's a, it's a, it's a, what appears to be a, uh, a colon, the DWI, DWI conviction of former state Supreme Court candidate Michelle McDonald was upheld Tuesday by the Court of Appeals. That is a tweet that he sent out because after Ms. McDonald submitted, added this to the Court of Appeals in uh, late last year, um, I went out on Twitter and found it because I had never retweeted that. I had never tweeted out, and Ms. McDonald was very specific that I tweeted it out on that day um, in her petition, in her complaint. Not anywhere does she reference it that it was actually sent out by a reporter with the Star Tribune, who I've never met before. Um, that tweet. At this point, uh, Your Honor, this is non-responsive. Um, well, I, 
maybe uh, maybe if I ask a question, I can help clarify it. I don't know. So this was a this was forwarded to you, and then there's a colon that says RT. Can can you explain what that means? Uh, it's I don't know if Shannon retweeted something, but I, I don't know what more I can say your honor to the court or to the record here i've submitted a sworn affidavit which said i haven't tweeted this out this isn't this wasn't written by me this is a screen capture of a supposed text message on a cell phone um if miss mcdonald had concerns ab about the the language that was written the dwi conviction of former states she should take it up with mr chavin channon who was the author of the tweet not me okay but you can't explain uh, what uh, and the at M Broadcorp, that is your Twitter handle, I assume? It is, is my right? Twitter handle. It is my Instagram handle. It is a number of things that I have. <laughs> okay. And then what does a colon RT mean, if you know? Well, the, the RT is the RT is after my name. It's not before my name. So it's not an, I don't know if Shannon retweeted it. I don't know. And I also don't know, I don't know the, what, what I'm looking at here in terms of, it appears to be, I don't know if this is a, if this is, I mean, it's a picture of a cell phone, but I don't, I'm not familiar with the construction of, I'm not familiar with that software. I don't know if Miss McDonald, if that's a text a note that can be edited. I don't know. But what I know is that the significant part of the, te of the tweet what she's objecting to is the at Shannon Strib and the semicolon and his title. I mean, the to me, this would be like Miss McDonald suing me over a story written by another reporter. I mean, okay. I didn't write it. All right, I I think I understand. Does everybody else understand? Because I think we can probably uh, wind this up. Anything? I, I got a couple of questions though, if I could. Well, Ms. Ratnayaka, are you done? Uh, yes, Your Honor, thank you. Okay, Mr. Ng, go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> Mr. Broadcourt, the, the first part is FWD, meaning forward, isn't that right? I don't know that, Mr. Ng. Okay, and then it says at M Broadcorp. That's your Twitter handle, is it not? That is my Twitter handle, my Instagram okay, I, handle. That's all I asked you, is it your Twitter handle? Yes or no? It is my Twitter handle. That's not my tweet. All right. And then re RT means retweet, does it not? In Twitter. But it's re Just a second. Does RT mean retweet in Twitter language? That's the question I have for you. That the answer to that question, in order for me to answer that question, I have to presume that what I'm looking at is a tweet. I don't know that that's a tweet. That's not, it's it's not a picture from Twitter. It's, so you've laid, and to be very honest with you, I'm not a lawyer, but you've laid no foundation that that's an actual tweet, an actual picture of something. This could be a note that she constructed. I, I don't. You can ask me till I'm blue in the face. I've submitted a sworn affidavit to the court, which said I never sent that tweet. It was never filed in the district court matter. And if Miss McDonald is upset about that tweet, she should take it up to the author of the tweet. Are not you done? Me. Are you done? Here's my Mr. question Ray. for you. RT means retweet. It, it follows right after your Twitter name, does it not? Yes or no? That's all I'm asking. I'm not, Ng, I'm, Mr. Ng, I'm not accepting the premise that that is a tweet from me at all. All right. It, would you accept? RT could be. Would you accept the premise as this is, this looks like a screenshot, a picture taken of a cell phone, uh, which you've, of course, seen pictures taken of cell phone screens before. True enough? You would accept that's that. a picture. Pardon no, me? I don't accept that. I, I, I accept that she's presenting as at such. I don't accept that's what it is. And then uh, did, were you did you during the course of the day after you testified watch this hearing at all? I was sequestered, Mr. Ng. I was outside doing yard work. And did you talk to anybody about your testimony before you were recalled here? I was. I was notified by the lawyer's board that I would be recalled. That was it. All right. No further questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Broadcorp. You're excused. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, uh, Mr. Eng, you have rested, is that correct? Well, then I'll call Michelle McDonald just to see what her interpretation of this is, and then we're done. All right. Judge, would you like me to leave this document up? Yes, please. Okay. May I call Ms. McDonald for the purpose yes. of just talking about this, this document, Your Honor? Yes. Ms. McDonald, showing you this um, document, what did you interpret this to mean when it says at M Broadcorp RT? What's that mean to you looking at this? That he tweeted the, the DUI conviction of former state Supreme Court candidate Michelle McDonald was upheld Tuesday by the Court of Appeals. Yeah. And RT means what? To you in your retweet, and it had his at Michael Broadcorb, and I again the message under the message above it was another. Uh, it was a uh, text from him. This text was in between, and then I, if you scroll it down a little bit, he sent me another request. Uh, I'm working on a post on judicial candidates. I was running at the time. So he retweeted that, or I thought he tweeted it. And I wrote him back, said, I did not get convicted of a DUI. Please get the facts straight and retract this. Material omissions will not be tolerated. That was the tweet I was talking about in my complaint. Okay. And he never retracted this. True. He never retracted it. No further questions. All right. Um, Mr. Eng, then, um, do you rest finally? I do. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes. And does the, uh, does the director rest finally? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Uh, let's, uh, we'll conclude the, the hearing then and let's go off the record, but I would like to continue to talk with counsel for a moment. So uh, uh, our court reporter can uh, can terminate the uh, the record of proceedings, and I'm just going to have a conversation now, preferably not live on YouTube, but just with counsel. Judge, judge, if you want a conversation that's not being streamed, I need to put you in a breakout room, or in, or at the hearing. Uh, well, what if I end the hearing? Then I end the hearing. That that won't work. Okay. Let's go in a break room. Okay. Break, uh, break. Um, everyone but the court reporter? Um, yes. And myself and Ms. Drynan? Yes, that's fine. Okay. And, and are you done with me or do you want me to hang in there until you guys are done talking? I think, I, I don't think we need you anymore, Marsha. Um, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Linda, can you stay with us too? Um, I don't think I can. I don't think I can go into the breakout room. Okay, because uh, uh, all right. Well, then we'll I'll ask you at another time or. Well, maybe I can. Yeah, I can. Okay.
Mr. Eng? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what do I have to do to get into this meeting here. Yeah, I I have you on. I have you as a as a uh, member of the breakout room, and the rest of us are in there. So what do I have to what what button do I have to push then? Shouldn't have to push anything. Hang on here. Let me. Uh... If you want to just put me on sound, I can do that too. I mean, it's just about scheduling anyway. So. Oh, wait a second, wait a second. Okay, I think, okay. Hey, hey, Mr. Ang? Mr. Ang? Oh, we're in, okay, all right. 